What's up, guys? This is the ninth podcast of Comic Book Debate. Uh, as always, I'm your host and editor in chief, Shiraz Faruqi, and I'm joined by my brother, Zayan. What's up, guys? My cousin, Umar. Hey, everyone. And my other cousin, Samir. Hey, guys. And today we got a very special guest. Uh, it's been, uh, you guys have been asking for him actually for a few months now, and finally we got a chance to. Uh, uh, collaborate with him on this podcast. It's none other than uh, Jay Oliva. Hey guys, it's a uh, it's me and not somebody who's not me posing as me. But uh, I don't have a check mark yet on my name, so uh, because you will. It's long overdue. You should get that check mark. But yeah, the, we got the real deal. It's the real Jay, guys. <laughs> so uh, I know it's a it's going to be a packed podcast. We're going to be going through a bunch of topics, but. Uh, I think the first one, question will start it off right away, uh, and this is, kind of, is something we ask everybody. But so tell us like your origin story, Jay. Like what got you? What makes you the person you are today? What's your origin story? <laughs> okay, well, I wish it was as cool as like me being crash landing in Kansas and being found by <laughs> you know Mon Pa Kent, but it's not as cool as that. Uh, well, you know, I uh, you know I'm in my 40s now, so I grew up in the 80s. I was uh, a kid who grew up watching uh, George Reeves Superman and watching the old, uh, you know, Gilligan's Island and, you know, the Nicholas Hammond Spider-Man and uh, on Electric Company, uh, Spider-Man as well as, uh, and, and also, of course, Super Friends. So as a kid, like, I loved, you know, I loved watching cartoons and I loved watching, I loved reading comics. You know, the first comic book I read was actually Secret Wars. My brother, who's actually 10 years older than me, uh, came home and he had gone to the comic book store and brought home the Secret Wars issues. Uh, you know, I forgot, it was like 1 to 10 because I think 11 and 12 hadn't come out yet. And it just changed my life. And so for the longest time, I was a Marvel person. Like, I, I ate up everything Marvel. I ate, uh, you know, X Men, uh, um, you know, all of the, you know, Avengers stuff. And Spider Man is my, he's my all time favorite. He's still my, my go to guy. Um, and then, uh, you know, a, little, a few years later, that's when uh, Dark Knight Returns hit. And my cousin, uh, it's funny that you guys are, you know, all related and it's all about family. Uh, my cousin, he, my brother was never a DC guy. And so my cousin comes to stay with us over the summer and he has the Dark Knight Returns, uh, you know, no, um, graphic novels. And it blew my mind because, again, I grew up with Adam West, Batman, and Super Friends, Batman. So I just thought Batman was basically uh, Sherlock Holmes with a cape, you know. Uh, and I read The Dark Knight Returns, and it just changed the way I, I saw the character. And so at that point, I, I was a fan, and I went out and I bought all the detective comics. I think uh, Denny O'Neill was the one who was doing it at the time. Uh, it was just, you know, anything I could get my hand on Batman. And then, of course, a couple of years later, what comes out, you know, 89 Bat. Batman movie comes out. So I'm in line with my Batman shirt. You know, I think I might have been like, I don't know, how many holes was I? Uh, 13 years old. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I saw it and it changed my life. And so, you know, that's why from then on, I was always uh, a kind of comic book fan. You know, um, I grew up with all the things 80s, like He-Man and, and She-Ra and all those kind of uh, uh, things from that, from that period. Um, once it hit the nineties, you know, that was, I was in my full swing of comic book collecting, you know, cause I was buying all of the Mc Todd McFarlane stuff and Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee. I mean, those were the guys that I looked up to. And the thing for me, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys can understand. So I come from an Asian family. So my parents are always like, don't go into art. There's no money in art. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'll be, I, they said, be a doctor. So I always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, and so, but I always had an aptitude to draw because, well, you know, I have an older brother who's 10 years older and my sister's about eight years older than me. Um, so I didn't really have anybody to play with at home. And uh, and so I just drew. So I taught myself how to draw. You know, I was a self-taught artist. There was no YouTube back then. So I used to go to the library and check out Draw 50 Animals by Lee J. Ames or whatever. And it's one of those things where it has, here's draw two circles. And then the next step is like a fully rendered horse. <laughs> and so I had to figure out how to draw. And what I used to do is I used to, um, uh, I would, uh, um, you know, with my Betamax and later VHS, I would record shows on TV freeze frame it and then put my piece of paper on top of the screen and trace it because and then i would then learn how to draw you know i learned how to draw robotech or any of these animated stuff um and uh and yeah so i just taught myself uh while i was in high school and in high school that's when i started actually really, you know 
drawing for a living. And in fact, that's the first time I ever got paid to, to, to draw. I designed the t-shirts for my, uh, my high school. Um, so if those, my old track team and cross country and football teams, uh, they've got the J Oliva t-shirts that are just limited to like a handful that exists in the world. That's crazy. Um, but, uh, one of the most defining moments, at least in my career, that changed at least the way that I thought about art um, as a professional kind of thing. Uh, at my local comics shop, it was called Comics Unlimited. It was in Hawaiian Gardens. It was a long time ago. It's no longer there. But John Romita Sr. was actually there. And he was looking at, he was, you know, you can come and meet him, have him sign comics. Uh, I brought my my drawings and I, and I said, could you take a look at this? And he looked at it and he gave me some really great words of encouragement. Made me, I mean, this is the first time I ever talked to another like professional artist, especially somebody like him. And he, he basically told me that like, you know, I, I had a really good handle of, you know, illustration and, and anatomy and uh, all the, I left that meeting and I was, I was, um, you know, I mean, not meeting, I left the comic book shop and I was on cloud nine. Cause I mean, I had, I had a professional telling me that I was actually pretty good. Um, so anyways, uh, but I then, but at that time, you know, I was like, well, image comics has already, was already a big thing. So I decided to, uh, uh, well, let, in the meantime, you know, I was applying to college. Um, uh, I, you know, at the same time I thought, well, all these people are breaking into image comics. Let me try to do it. So I was working on my, my, my samples of getting in. And then at about, about 19, uh, I'm sorry, in about 2000 and, four or five. Um, I was in college. Um, that was my second year. I went to college to be, uh, I was a bio major, uh, cause again, I wanted to get a pre-med. Uh, and I, uh, I had already taken all my communication arts requirements classes. So I took like art of the cinema and all these kind of other classes. But I remember that I needed, uh, I needed to fulfill another comm class and they didn't really have any much that I was really interested in, but they did have animation. Now, full disclosure, I never wanted to be an animator. Like, never. Uh, the only time I ever really dabbled at the thought of ever doing anything that's similar to animation is that I saw the, um, the making of Empire Strikes Back back in the day where they, where they showed uh, uh, ILM doing the Tauntaun and doing, like, here, you move his foot, take a picture, you move that. And I remember just being fascinated by it. But at the same time, I'm like, man, that's a really tedious job. I don't think I want to do that. And so I, uh, you know... I took animation because uh, again, I, I was a self-taught artist. Um, the first art classes I ever took were in college and they were just like, here's, here's my first life drawing class. And then I took animation because again, I could draw. Um, and I was pretty good at mimicking different styles. I could eight different styles. I could do the Disney style, the Warner Brothers style. So I figured, you know, and I, I can, let me just do this. Even though I was not interested in, in making a duck walk or, you know, do, do cloth animation. That's just like the most boring thing. But anyways, my professor was uh, Van Partible, who was the guy who created Johnny Bravo. Um, and uh, I remember it was, it was a couple of weeks into the, uh, the, you know, I think it was called the Animation 110. Um, it was... The, it was, we were about to do what's called the anticipation kind of thing, where it's basically a tea kettle. Like you, you animate a tea kettle where it's about to blow up, uh, and then and then it blows up. So it's they call it anticipation. It's supposed to teach you, you know, the real use of squash and stretch and these kind of animation techniques. Anyways, right before he goes over it, he comes in and he starts talking about storyboarding. So he's like, "Well, this is how you do storyboards." And you know, me, me, I'm 19 years old. I'm listening to this story. I'm like, "Okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm never gonna use this, right?" <laughs> and uh, and I just thought, "Okay, yeah, it's just keyframe animation, whatever. Uh, teach me the next stuff." So, anyways, fast forward uh, uh, a few months. So I finish that semester. I get an A. I do a pretty good job. I don't think I'm the best in my class, though. But you know, I think Van saw some. I did some good work, so I, I, he gave me a good, a good, good grade. So the following semester, this is in um, the so that was two thousand five. So this is not the January of two thousand. Um, oh, sorry, not two thousand five. My God, my memory's bad. And this is nineteen ninety five, and in nineteen ninety six in January or was it February? Um, there was a uh, animation job uh, kind of. Expo. So, so you basically it was at the Universal Hilton here at the right next to Universal Studios. Actually, it was next to the yeah the Hilton. Um, 
And it, all the animation studios were there. You know, Disney was there, Warner Brothers, they were all there. And basically, again, this was before the internet. So you would go there with your portfolio and you would, you know, there would be tables set up, almost like a Comic-Con, you know. And uh, behind every table would be like directors or recruiters or, you know, various people to look at portfolios. Because, again, they're trying to staff up for the upcoming season. Um, because back in the day, the hiring season used to be from January till about March. If you didn't find a job then, you had to wait until the next rotation. Nowadays, it's, it's all through the year. But anyways, um, I show up and I am like a fish out of water because, I mean, I'm 19 years old. I don't even have a portfolio, right? <laughs> um, I, I'm one of those artists who I, I get a mental block when I try to draw in a sketchbook, right? Because I want to make every page look good and then I end up not drawing anything at all in a sketchbook. So I'm the kind of artist that I need to have loose leaf paper. So I just have loose leaf paper. That way, if I don't like the way it drawing, so I just crumple it up and throw it away. So anyways, I was about to, you know, go in there without anything. And my, my cousin turns to me, you know, the same cousin who, who showed me the Dark Knight Returns um, way back in the day because he was the one who convinced me. He's like, you should go to this. And I was like, I don't know, because uh, the Comic-Con right before that in 1995, I had actually brought my 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 page samples my pencil samples for comic books to uh the san diego comic-con in 1995 which was my first con and i had shown it around to a bunch of different studios they kind of liked it but i remember i remember this very specifically i showed it to uh rob lifefield's uh because uh, he had they had it, at the time image was huge so they had a huge booth but i showed it to what was it i think Com- awesome comics or oh, i forgot what the name of their 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 uh uh, it was called, but um, um, the guy who was back there, I don't even know if he was a, another artist, an editor or whatnot, but he basically told me that my anatomy sucked and that I need to work on a lot of things and that I probably won't ever get a job in, anim- in uh, not animation, in, uh, in comics. And so that just, just devastated me, right? Oh, uh, and I just thought, well, okay, I guess, I guess being a professional artist is, isn't my thing. So fast forward, so this is the summer prior to me taking animation. Fast forward back in uh, February, I'm, I'm, I'm about to go in and my cousin's like, hey, you know, just bring in some drawings. And so I was like, fine. So I had a, I had like a, some, a bunch of drawings in my trunk. So I grabbed a handful of drawings and uh, I didn't even have a portfolio. So there was a manila folder with somebody else's name on it. So I just took a Sharpie and crossed it out and shoved just these drawings inside there. And I walked in and... Uh, and then what happens is that my cousin, we split up. He said, hey, I'll go on the left side. You check out the right. So I'm looking around. I'm seeing you know, all the different tables. Disney's there, Nickelodeon, all the different big studios. Uh, they were still doing a lot of features back then. So they were also crewing up for a lot of the upcoming features. Because um, remember, this was like the golden age of animation. This is when Lion King and Aladdin and all these kind of like, you know, big feature films were making a lot of money in the box office. So they were really trying to crew up with talented you know, individuals. So anyways, I'm walking around. I don't really show anything to anybody. My cousin comes running up to me and he's like, hey, uh, Marvel Films is, or Marvel Studios is, you know, over in the back there. Why don't you show them your stuff? So I was like, ah, okay, whatever. So I go there and uh, there's two tables. There's one table that's just crowded with artists. There must have been like 10 or 15 people around it uh, because there, that was for the new kind of hot show, which was The Incredible Hulk, right? It was The Incredible Hulk. It was going to be a new show that's on Fox. Uh and right next to it is the table for the Spider-Man for the 90s, the 90s, the Fox show of Spider-Man. And there's only one guy in line. So I was like, oh, let me just go look over there. So I look over this guy's shoulder, and he's showing uh, comic book pencil pages to uh, the storyboard supervisor or director on, on the other side of the table. And these are like, I remember they were like the most beautiful pages ever. Like they, I, w- I wanted to cry like how beautiful they were. And... Uh, and so at the end of looking at this guy's portfolio, he looks at the guy and says, hey, this, this is some great stuff. Do you have any storyboard samples? And the guy's like, storyboard? What's that? And so the guy behind the table is like, well, you know, storyboards are like how we plan out the animation. So, um, you know, if you ever get any samples, uh, here's my card. Let me know. So he guy leaves. I come up next. And I'm 19 year old. I have no idea. I've never done a job interview in my life. I come up. And I remember the like 15 minutes, you know, that my professor in college had talked about, um, you know, storyboarding. So I'm going up there and I'm just blabbering anything that comes to my mind, like storyboards. I know storyboards. I'm a student at, you know, at this university. I'm taking animation, this, 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 you know, and then the, the guy behind the table, Bill Riling, 
uh, he, you know, he looks at me, he's like shaking his head. And I'm, I bet in his in mind, he's like, yeah, God, it's another kid. So anyways, I, uh, you know, he takes out my drawings from my manila folder, my ratty manila folder. And he starts going through and it's all just pinups. Like here's Spider-Man, here's Wolverine, here's Cable, here's, you know, uh, all, all these, you know, at the time, all the, comic, all the comic book stuff that I love, Batman, Superman, that kind of stuff. So I'm just going through it. And again, none of this is animation friendly, right? And I'm, I'm there standing in front of him just trying to say anything that's kind of like will be a buzzword. Like if I say the magic word, he's going to be like, what is that? You're hired, right? <laughs> and I, again, I have no clue of how to do a job interview. So I'm just like trying to just list all the things that I know and how much I love Spider-Man and I don't know what I was saying. But here's the thing, this is where it's a life-changing moment that uh, it happens, I think it happens to everyone, and you have to just be able to identify it. Um, I had, luckily, in that, in that, in that uh, wad of paper that I had grabbed out of my trunk, the storyboards for my student film that I had done in the, in the animation class. At the end of, of, of an animation class, you do like a little film, anywhere it's like a minute to two minutes long of just animation, right? But I had done the storyboards on basically an animation bond paper, because it was easy. And Mike looked at me and he's like, what the hell's wrong with you? I'm like, what? And he's like, listen, if you do it and they don't like it, well, you know, you'll know. But here's the thing, if you do it and they, and they like it and they love it, this could change your life. And I think that was that was the motivational speech I needed to to have, you know. And and to this day, Mike and I, I always I always uh, give him a call every now and then. I'm just tell him like, man, you changed my life because I I did an all nighter that night, finished the test, turned it in the next day, and the following week I get a call from Bill saying, hey, um, uh, we liked your test, you know, can you come start? And uh, and so yeah, I started as a revisionist, which is the very bottom of the barrel, you know, because they don't teach storyboarding in school really, other than the like I said, the kind of few minutes that my professor had really taught. So um, I had to kind of learn on my own, and you know, the way I learned was I asked I asked my, Bill Ryling, who was the supervising um, producer, I mean supervising director um, on the show like how do you learn and so he just gave me uh, a copy of the five c's of cinematography which at the time was out of print you can get it now on amazon and a bunch of other places mm -hmm. but it was like a xerox copy of it and then uh he gave me a storyboard uh, a stack of storyboards from the show from spider-man that was maybe about uh two almost three feet tall or high you know just storyboards yeah. and he says read this book and look at this and I was like, that's it? He's like, well, yeah. He's like, nobody really teaches it. You just got to have to just learn it. And I was like, okay. So I, um, I what do you call it? I, I, would, I would work my eight hours. So I, at the time, I was still going to school. So I would go to school from 8 to 12. Then I'd drive into work from 1 to about uh, 10 o'clock. And then from 11 to about 1 o'clock, I would read the book. And I would look at storyboards. And I did that every night, you know. And, and eventually, it kind of clicked. It's like riding a bike, you know. Um, I realized that anytime Spider-Man was in trouble, it was a downshot. Anytime, you know, the Green Goblin or the Kingpin was like, I have you now, Spider-Man, ha, 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 it was an upshot. And that's when the whole kind of demystifying of storyboarding and filmmaking all kind of all started clicking. I became a sponge. I started reading director, you know, books about directors and, and you know, anything I could get about, you know, how to make film, I was just absorbing it. Um, and then, yeah, and then after that, you know, long story short, I went to Sony after that, and um, I remember I worked my way to storyboards because I asked my director, like, how much do storyboard artists make? And they're like, he told me, and it was like, you know, double what I was making as a revisionist. So I said, I got to do that job. So within, I was a storyboard artist, I think, in about six months. So, and then, uh, and then I was a storyboard artist now, and then I, you know, I went to Sony, and, uh, and then my first show for Sony was extreme ghostbusters mm -hmm. so i i worked on that for sony adelaide and during that time um they had promoted some of the storyboard arts to directors you know there were some storyboard arts who had who had been with the studio for uh, some time and they, they promoted them and i went to my producer i was like hey uh did those guys have to like pass a test like how do you become a director do you have to join the directors guild of america or something and my producer's like, no, no, no. He's like, listen, if your storyboards go through with about 95% unchanged, he's like, he's like, you're ready for to be a director. 
And I was like, huh, interesting. And then I was like, so how much do those guys make? And then he told me, and it was like twice or, uh, yeah, twice or three times as much as I was making as a, as a uh, storyboard artist. So I was like, I got to learn how to do that. So uh, by the time I was 21, I became a director. That's, so I was directing. I, my first thing I directed was uh, yeah. Roughnecks of Starship Trooper Chronicles. It was based on uh, the Starship Trooper film by Sony, but also more. But we based it a lot more on the actual book by Heinlein. And, uh, and that's where I learned how to direct. It was a CG show. Uh, and and that's that was how I started. And then from there, you know, that is, you can check my filmography for all the rest no. of the stuff. <laughs> but again, it's a long story, but I, I think it's great to let the audience, let your fans know that like, no, actually, you know, yeah, they're actually your if fans you really want it, you can get it. No, but actually, honestly, that was a very inspiring story. I mean, just even from us, like we're taking it from you. Uh, First of all, I think, you know, they're not even our fans, they're your fans. I think everyone's been listening to this, will be listening to hear your insight and hearing uh, the lessons that you're giving from your own life experience. And the irony here is that you started out with uh, Spider-Man, the animated series, and that's kind of around the time where we started even getting introduced to Spider-Man. So the first really? time I ever even knew Spider-Man was, was from the animated series. You know, I was born in 1994. That's around the time when the show was just getting started. And, well, uh, my first my first episode I worked on was the Hobie Brown Prowler episode, oh, and nice. I ended up doing that. And I did the the Secret Wars. That Secret Wars was when they're fighting the giant worms. That was the first uh, fight sequence I ever storyboarded. So if you wild. ever want to look back at that, that is the first I'm, thing that I ever going to have like, to revisit did. it. Yeah, <laughs> but no, uh, like you said, like you're you start your career off with Spider Man, and again, that's where the four of us, uh, at least me, uh, Ziana and I in particular. We really started our love for superheroes with shows like Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Spider-Man the Animated uh -huh. Series. So, again, when we, when, we, when we found out that you actually started out with Spider-Man, now hearing your story uh, to see how you got that gig in the first place, uh, that's pretty wild. And uh, moving on, like we're moving from the 90s into the early 2000s, and obviously you're doing your work with Sony, and you're moving up. Uh, there's actually one show... Uh, has like a, a niche fan base, but I definitely want to touch on it. Like, how is I, it? I know myself and Shraz really love this show. Oh, we love this show. But how Which is one? it like working on uh, Jackie Chan Adventures? Like, that oh. was... <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that was a great show. I mean, the wildest thing was Jackie. Jackie actually came to the studio and and talked to all the directors and the artists and stuff, and kind of said, you know. Uh, and just briefly, he's like, "Listen, I'm not Bruce Lee, so I'm I'm not cool. If you know, I, I'm the kind of reluctant hero. So when you when we do the fight sequences, it's always about being creative and and, and having the comedy in it. And it's really kind of really interesting trying to hear it from you know from his kind of point of view, how he sees himself or his brand, as well as how he he does his own kind of filming and stuff. And so it was really cool. Yeah, Jackie Chan Adventures, I did. I did quite a. I storyboarded on that for quite a bit of time, but I also directed on the last season of Jackie Chan Adventures. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So uh, I think uh, next question we'll give it to Johnny. Want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I guess since we're, I mean, we're a comic debate, we're a superhero heavy podcast. So I guess we can jump straight into your superhero related work. I mean, you talked about Spider Man, the anime series. Um, oh. My favorite hero is Batman. So let's talk about your first work with Batman, which is the Batman, the show. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So here's a, here's a funny story. So uh, I had become a director, you know, I'd done Starship Troopers. And, you know, uh, I later on, I was directing over at Sony. And I thought, you know what, my boards are pretty good. I think they're pretty good. Let me go and drop them. Off. Let me drop my portfolio off at Warner Brothers, you know, because again, I, I, I love what Bruce Timm and company had been doing. And I mean, Batman is Batman, you know, so yeah. I, uh, I dropped it off there thinking that I'm going to get a call and they're going to hire me and everything. Uh, I think this might have been 2000, uh, and I don't get a call. A month later, I get a, I finally get a call, and they said, hey, can you come pick up your portfolio? I was like, okay. So I, I show up, I pick up my portfolio, I open it up, and it doesn't even look like they even looked at it. And that's when I just decided, well, I guess Bruce Timm doesn't like my stuff, and I just gave up my dreams of working on Batman. So fast forward, I, had, uh, I was directing or supervising director on um, – he Man and the Masters of the Universe, the reboot, right, mm -hmm. back in 2001, 2002. Uh, I had finished that, and uh, you know, I was looking around for gigs, and that was when you know, my, one of my buddies was like, hey, I'm doing Batman. Why don't you come over here? So I went over, but, it, but I, was, I was so excited. I was like, oh, Batman, this is awesome. And then I find they're like, no, no, it's the Batman, and Bruce isn't involved. I'm like, what? I'm like, uh, okay, but it's still Batman, you know? 
And so uh, if you watch that first season, I did quite a few. I did the first Mr. Freeze, the Clue Master, uh, the Penguin one. But uh, you'd usually tell it actually became kind of my signature signature thing where if a Batarang explodes, most likely it's a sequence that I did because I figured, you know what? If you have batteries, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put grenades on that bad boy. And if you look at my later Batman films, all the stuff that I've done, Batman always has exploding batteries. Oh, wow. But I started it started all with that the Batman. So I did that for about a uh, I worked on it for almost a full season. But then I left to do to go back to Sony to direct on because uh, I was only storyboarding on that. So I uh, I left to do um, uh, Jackie Chan Adventures the last season. And then I did an episode of Boondocks, and you know I was going to be on Boondocks, but that's when Marvel Lionsgate called and said, "Hey, we're going to be doing these direct-to-video movies. Would you like to come and direct it?" And I was like, oh, "Are yeah. you kidding me? This is great!" And it was going to be the first one is Iron Man, the Invincible Iron Man. Oh yeah, we're and, gonna uh, yeah definitely we're actually gonna get to those like uh, as you get through your career. Just, we're gonna hit- just one more question, just jump back on the uh-huh. Batman. Um, how much pressure was there coming off? You know, like the obviously it was Batman Beyond, but outside of Bruce Timm's Batman work, the Batman was the next thing. So how much pressure was that going into that? Uh, not really so much pressure. I mean, I think the biggest pressure was just whether the fans were going to like it or not. You know, uh, At least in terms of working on the show, all the people working on the show all wanted to work for Bruce, but we figured, you know, let's just show what we can do, you know, uh, and, and hopefully Bruce will take notice of it because at the time – you know, Bruce, Bruce and his crew were a couple floors up from us, and we were on the ground floor. We are on the same ground floor with uh, Teen Titans. And, uh, and so we just figured, you know, let's just, let's just do what we did. And I didn't even think that Bruce was going to look at it, because honestly, I don't think Bruce even really cared about that show. Uh, but the reason I was gonna I was gonna get what I was talking about when I did Invincible Iron Man was because around that same time my one of my, my buddy Joaquin Dos Santos who is right now is the executive producer of Voltron, uh, he he's like hey I'm directing on uh, Justice League Unlimited uh, I need uh, I need somebody to do some freelance storyboards are you interested and in my head I was like this is a way for me to get my work in front of Bruce Tim so of course I jumped at the chance and I did the freelance for him. And it was, uh, ooh, I think it was, might have been the Flash Appreciation Day or, ooh, there was a bunch of, I did a couple of Just League Unlimited, but apparently Bruce liked it. And and he had, and Joaquin had told me that, yeah, he actually complimented. And the thing is, it's hard to get Bruce to compliment you as a board artist because it, unless, he doesn't really interact with you unless you're a director. So the fact, I guess that was a good kind of sign so that when they called me later on to do, to work on Superman Doomsday, uh back then you had to be i guess sanctioned or approved of by bruce tim if you were going to work on his shows so he had to kind of vet you personally in order for you to even just storyboard for him so luckily uh, the work i had done on unlimited kind of proved myself to him and i and i then i did uh the uh, superman doomsday and that was the first of many dtvs that i had done for them yeah um the first batch were all was all just uh what do you call that was all just uh uh, freelance because again i was still at marvel and i was directing on the marvel films but then uh then then i came in house a little bit a few years later oh nice so Omar, Omar, you got you got a question? Yeah. So uh, just moving on a little bit to, uh, to some of the the greatest animated films from DC. So how was your time working on The Dark Knight Returns uh, in 2012, 2013? Oh, it was. That came with that. Okay. So here, so here's where I was. Um, so I had so. I, I had gone to. I had. I was at. I finished my my stint at at um, at Marvel Lionsgate. You know, I did like three films for them. Then I went to Disney and I did Winnie the Pooh. But then I, when that ended, I I called around and uh, Warner Brothers was like, "Why don't you come over here? We have some stuff." And at the time, I was doing freelance for Batman: Brave and the Bold for Brandon Vietti, and and so uh, Brandon, while I was doing that, uh, my time was split between. Um, uh, public enemies and then we started doing all these dtvs while i was there that lauren montgomery was directing and sam lee was directing uh which was like uh, apocalypse and on all of those shows but then what happened was um young justice happened and brandon vietti who i've been buddies with he's like hey i want you to be a director on it so while i was on first season of young justice lauren montgomery who uh she was she was going to leave uh, i guess she was going to leave warner brothers to go to nickelodeon i think that's when she went there to do avatar i think um 
uh, and she was she was already slated to do Dark Knight Returns, but they hadn't started yet. But, so they had done uh, Batman Year One while I was, uh, I think, in the early part of, of Young Justice. And when they asked me if they wanted to help, I said, well, I can only do a few pages. So if you watch Year One, I only did like uh, I did the fight where uh, uh, Gordon is fighting uh the guy with the bat and he beats him up and then leaves him on the side of the road naked. So I did those sequences, but you know, I loved year one, you know, I love yeah. Master Shelley's work and I loved, yeah. you know, I loved the, that original comic. So, but I felt sad that I didn't get to do more than that because of my schedule on young justice. So when Lauren came to me, she's like, you know, Hey, I'm going to be doing dark Knight returns. You know, do you, are you available? And I said, of course. And I told her, can I, can you give me something cool? And she's like, well, She's like, what would you like to work on? And I was like, I want to do the, I was like, let me have the Joker sequence. And she's like, well, that's going to be in part two. And I'm like, oh, it's a two-parter. She's like, yeah. I was like, wow, that's great. And then I'm like, okay, well, what sequences have you handed out? And she's like, I haven't handed any sequences out. You have first pick. So I was like, okay, let me have the mutant fight. Like, I want to do the, the first beginning of the mutant fight in the mud, uh, before the mud pit. And then I want to do oh, the junkyard fight. And then I want to do the mud pit fight. So uh, she said, okay, it's yours. And then what happens, uh, maybe about, a few weeks later, I, I get called into a meeting. It's Bruce Tim, you know, the heads of the head of Warner Bros. Animation as well. And they're like, Lauren is leaving. And I'm like, what? And then they're like, and she, you know, we've discussed this and we want you to to do Dark Knight Returns 1 and 2. And, I w- and they're like, you know, I was like, well, what does that mean for Young Justice? And they're like, well, you, if you want it, you're going to have to leave it. And I was like, okay. So I told Brandon, I'm like, sorry, you know, my last episode, I was already on episode 20. 25 so we're at the end of the season so me leaving wasn't that big of a deal and i remember driving home that day after getting assigned that because remember you don't really they don't you get assigned the shows like i don't like for example just the war it, it's just how it lands i just happen to get it you know um so getting dark knight returns after you know again like i told you my story that changed my life I'm driving home on the freeway and I'm just, you know, I was in traffic, but I had the biggest grin on my face. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and, and it wasn't, and, and, you know, in the back of my mind, there was a little bit of, you know, a little bit of kind of like, can I really do this? But honestly, like, I, I was never afraid of going to bat and, and knocking a home run, you know, every single time. Uh, I just wanted a chance. I just, just give me a chance and I'll, 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 I'll knock it out of the park. And so, um, and yeah, so I did. I did uh, Dark Knight Returns uh, one. Uh, this is now. This is what's funny is that um, I had I had done some freelance work for Blur Studios for some um, cinematics for games that they showed at E three, and and uh, and this was in April. I I was I was just finishing up Dark Knight Returns at least pre production, which is storyboards, and and I was about to prep for Dark Knight Returns two when I get a call from Tim Miller and Tim Miller, who's one of the co-owners of Blur and also the director of Deadpool, uh, before he did Deadpool, of course, he gives me a call and I'm like, oh, is there notes? What do you want me to do? And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, hey, uh, I got a call from Zack Snyder's office and he's looking for a, a, you know, a talented storyboard artist to help him on a project that I can't tell you, but you could probably guess what it is. And he's like, is it is it cool if I give him your reference? And in my And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? You give him my number. <laughs> And uh, and I got off the phone with him, and I was it was like I said, I felt like it was that moment when I got my test, and I was on cloud nine. But I was like, okay, keep it cool, Jay, because if I don't get a call from them or whatever, I don't want to be destroyed because you know. Uh, and then I get a call from Zach's assistant uh, probably the next day, and he's like, hey, can you come out and meet Zach? There you go. I, I have a story for that, but you can ask me some other questions. <laughs> yeah, but, but anyways, but anyways, yeah, I did. Dark, the whole point of the story, sorry, is that uh, I had to fly to Chicago to do Man of Steel, and while I was there, I was doing Dark Knight Returns too. I was directing it from Chicago with my crew here in LA because I didn't want to give it up. I was like, I, I, I talked to I talked to Warner Bros. Animation. I'm like, this is good. I can't say no to this Man of Steel thing. But I'm in the middle of Dark Knight Returns 2, and honestly, I have it all worked out, so let me just do it, please. And they, I mean, luckily enough, they, they let me do it. Thank God. Thank you, Warner Brothers Animation, for letting me do that. Uh, but yeah, and that's, that's what started my live action career. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Just to jump back to the Dark Knight Returns, I mean, personally, Part 1 and 2 are still my absolute favorite anime films of all time. Oh, and, nice. Uh, Thank you. That's almost that, awesome. that means a lot. Yeah, I mean, you guys did such a brilliant job really capturing the graphic novel so perfectly um but like when you adapt like a story like that 
you know, where, when do you decide what parts you should keep, what parts you shouldn't, and when was the decision made to make it the first um, two-parter direct, uh, direct DVD film? Uh, okay, well, the decision to make it a two-parter, that you know, it's above my pay grade, but it was most likely, you know, it's Bruce Tim and Home Video. Basically, what they do is the producers like Bruce Tim, James Tucker, uh, Mike Carlin, I think they they have they go to the corporate headquarters at Warner Bros. with Home Video, that, which basically Home Video is the one who come who comes up with our budgets and and has release windows. You know, like that's why we release like two or three films a year. Um, so they're like, what ideas do you have for you know to stuff you know for things to to come out you know in our in our next release you know kind of quarter or whatnot, and uh, I'm sure like we had just finished year one, so I'm sure it was they were kicking around doing you know the Dark Knight Returns because remember Bruce had done that version in in his um, what do you call it in the animated series where it was kind yeah. of very Frank Miller esque, so I know that they were always kicking that around and trying to figure out how to do it, but I think initially. Uh, they had tried to make it fit in one movie and realized they had to make a lot of concessions because there's a lot in there. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and so that's when the idea of, of doing a two-parter. And, and actually what helped a lot was the fact that Superman Doomsday, um, the sales of that was great, but a lot of the critics and a lot of the kind of buzz around it was that they didn't do the the story, the yeah, the original story, right? Because we had to kind of condense it and do our kind of version of it to fit yeah. within our 72 minutes, 80 minute kind of time frame. So with the Dark Knight Returns, you know, Bruce and those guys were able to convince them, like, why don't we do it as a two part? Let's, let's see how that that is. And this is something new. And you know, uh, and so um, you know, they they had Bob Goodman do the the screenplay and do the script. Um, and so by the time I got it, the script was already done for the most part and uh and and then and then i already knew you know it was going to go all the way up to the end of the mutant fight and then the second part was going to be all joker stuff so um uh, both of those scripts i think were pretty much done almost near the same time so i kind of knew you know what i was going to kind of plan for because i again I, I went back and read the read the comic religiously tried to you know figure out how i'm going to adapt this but here's the thing like uh, even when you adapt something, people say. I mean, I've heard, I've read some things where people said, "Well, of course it's good because he just followed the uh, he just followed the storyboards of the comic." And I'm yeah. like, "No, no, no. It's it's a lot harder than that because uh, it's pacing and and knowing when to use the comic book panel or the staging or do something totally different or something yeah. that's still in the in the same vein but uh, is still." true to the source material. So I had to go in, and you know, there were a couple. I like. There, I remember we were having. Uh, we were having a meeting. It was me, Bruce, and a couple of designers, and we were trying to design. Let's say, um, I think it was like Bruce's. Um, the uh, in 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 Wayne Mansion, there's that kind of outcropping that that that, that Bruce is standing on when it's raining, and then he stand and and then like the uh, he has he hears Batman's voice in his head in part one, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it flashbacks. It flashbacks to his parents getting killed and everything. So, anyways, we were we were trying to figure. We were designing that that set, and we were looking at the comic and. And there's a scene in there where Bruce apparently is naked and his hand is open, but the rain is hitting his hand. But half the room were, was convinced that Bruce was in the shower and that, that, that foamy thing in his hand was a soap. And then the other, the other <laughs> half, which was me, myself, I, I mean, my, what I was thinking of was what, no, no, he, he, was, he stripped himself naked and standing in, in, the ra- in the rain like a baptism, you know, like he's... he's, he's uh, but it was just funny that you know we we went back and forth a lot of times trying to like what exactly did Frank mean in this panel in some cases you know other times it was pretty clear but it's not like we could just give you know Frank Miller a call and be like what did you think of that so I had to really try to um, you know work with what Bob Goodman's script was as well as find how I wanted to adapt it how I saw it I mean really it's 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 Frank Miller through the lens of Jay Oliva is really what it is, you know, mm-hmm. and I tried yeah. to be as reverent and, 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 uh, you know, adapt as much as I can of the source material, but at the same time still take some artistic license because, uh, because I was the director. I wanted to do that. Like, for example, like, uh, if, in the very, this is one of the Easter eggs. I didn't tell Bruce Tim about this, but when, when, uh, when Bruce walks by the, the mutant kids and they're dancing to a boombox, one of the kids is dancing the RoboCop dance, which is a, oh, Robo- wow. a, a dance from the 80s when I was a kid. And I just thought, 
know, I'm going to put that in there. I'm not going to tell anybody until after it's animated. <laughs> but it's stuff like that that's like, you know what, it doesn't ruin the, the narrative, but it's something that I thought, well, you know, it's still 80s. And it's something I'm the director. Let me put these things in that I love. So if there's also, for example, in part two, when they're fighting through the uh, apartment buildings in the back, you'll see the poster of Christopher Reeve. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah uh, we noticed we that. Know, yeah. We noticed yeah. that. One. Oh yeah. So that was me. I wanted to do that. Bruce was like, he's like, no, Jay. He's like, and then, but I, I told Bruce, listen, I had already talked to legal. We approved all of it. Like we own that image. Warner Bros. owns that. They have no, you know, there's no reason that they said that we can't use it. So, I'm just going to put it so at the time, Bruce, he was already, he had done so many of these DTV. So uh, to my benefit, I think he kind of let me do almost anything that I wanted to do, mostly because he was like, you know, he had done it so much. I think after that, he had, they had made the announcement he was going to step back for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, and it was great for me because, and before that, I mean, Bruce is a super talented guy, um, but a lot of times he's, he's very, he scrutinizes, you know, a lot of his movies when he's doing it. Um, when I got, when I got involved, I was lucky cause I came in the tail end and he kind of let go a lot of the reins that he normally would do. Um, and it allowed, and allowed me to be a little bit more creative than I, than any of the other past directors. So I was very fortunate about oh, that. Nice. And, 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 you know, I, I always thank Bruce for that. Thank you. Let, thank you for letting me, you know, try things that he wouldn't really try. Like for example, the death of his parents, I wanted to change it from, uh, because there's always, there's always, everybody always does like in the, the way Bruce has done it. It's always underneath the lamp, you know, the lamp, it's yeah. that, that kind of pool uh, of light, and his parents are dead there. And I, and I remember when we were recording it w- with Peter Weller, I turned to Bruce and I said, Bruce, I have an idea to do something different. Are you cool with me just doing something different than what is, uh, what's been done traditionally, what he's done? And also maybe it's a little different from the comic. And he's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, I've done this a million times, so let me just see what you do. And so I did it this way. And the idea, the, what I did was that, uh, I wanted Joe Chill to be underneath the light, and I wanted the, that way you couldn't see his face. And I wanted because I always thought that the birth of the Batman should be in the darkness, you know. And so when when his when his and and plus I had the imagery in my head of the pearls falling, but I wanted to have the streets to be already have water on it, so that way it's a mirror kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And when and when the pearls hit the the water, you ripple it. And the idea that. Uh, if you look at there's this there's this last there's this one shot that I did that uh, it's in the flashback where it's little Bruce standing there and his parents are dead and the blood is kind of mixing with the water as rain is coming down. Well, if you look at his shadow, it's the Batman cape. His shadow is cast and it's it's the Batman cape. Oh, wow. and, and and the idea is that I want it to be that's the birth of the Batman. So that way, when he comes back in uh, as Batman, you know, in Dark Knight Returns Part One, you know, it's raining again and it's almost like again it's his rebirth. And it's and I, I wanted to tie it to you know the, the rain and, and the water and the symbolism to that um, and just tie it in you know because again that's what a director does I, I try to do stuff like that but so it's still still very much true to the source but I add my own little twists and, um, and, and the details and the details yeah. amazing when you like when you when you watch it I mean you're seeing it when you happen you're like oh that's a really cool sequence or that's an amazing shot but when you hear it like especially from the director's mouth like exactly what was the thought process it just makes it 10 times cooler and uh so much better yeah so let's get a samir in there right now samir you have a question uh yeah so moving back to marvel a little bit what was it like storyboarding episodes of uh spectacular spider-man and how different was that compared to your work on um the original show uh, you know, it's funny, by the time I did Spectacular Spider-Man, I had already done uh, the MTV CG Spider-Man. So I had done already two Spider-Man series by the time I did the Spectacular Spider-Man one. Um, and it's funny because Vic Cook, the producer, uh, he gives me a call. I was At the time, I was already working at Marvel uh, Lionsgate, directing on the, the animated films. And he called me and said, hey, you know, can you come help me out on this? And he wanted me to direct on it. And I told him, like, no, I'm, I'm cool where I'm at. I'm having fun here. And, and he's like, well, can you least storyboard and help me out? So I was like, and I told him, like, listen, Vic, because, like, I've done Spider-Man a, a lot in my career. I don't really need that. I need to do it again. But because, I, you know, I, I've always wanted to work with you, um, I'll, I'm willing to – I want to work with you. So let's let's do this. So I uh, I ended up doing Spectacular Spider-Man, you know, and uh, – it was it was it was it was, it was interesting because it was almost like I, at the time I thought oh this is my career going full circle you know I started with Spider Man now it's Spider Man uh, and 
and it was it was cool. It was a, it was a fun show. I mean, uh, I know the fans liked it a lot. It was it was a tough show to do because there was a lot that has to be done. It was just like Young Justice, you know. There was a lot of, you know, um, character interactions, a lot of big fight sequences, um, all trying to fit that in into like this little kind of box, uh, you know, the twenty two minute kind of constraints. Uh, but it was cool. I mean, I got I did the what did I do? I did the Venom episode where he fights Venom for the first time. I did the uh, Electro. I did. I think I did the Sinister Six. I did a lot of them, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But those are the ones that I remember. Yeah, I mean, very and, vividly. and in Spider-Man pop culture, I think when it comes to those animated shows, the two things people remember the most is the original '90s show and then Spectacular mm-hmm. Spider-Man. So you have your hands on both of them, which is which is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, which is which is really kind of funny when you think about that. Yeah, you know? and then and then of course, like when I when I helped them out on Spider-Man: Homecoming, I was like, now it's for a full circle. Yeah, <laughs> you know, now you got like, everything. Three yeah. animated yeah. shows. And now I'm doing the, you know, the homecoming. I was like, yeah. okay, now I can see that. So that's why with uh, with Batman, you know, when I was working with um, with Ben, I was thinking the same thing. You know, I did the Batman, then worked my way up through all the DC stuff, and now yeah. I get to do, you know, the Batman with Ben Affleck. And I was like, now it's full circle. And then, you know, that didn't work wow. out. Now, so speaking <laughs> of actually on the animated side, I think we should. And I, I'm not the animated. I mean, the live action side. I think we can segue right into that and. Uh, uh, jump back to when you were talking about Man of Steel and how was it like, you know, first meeting Zack Snyder and uh, that whole like process. So how? Just give me your uh, one hundred and one so, on that. Yeah. So so anyways, uh, so with my story, I you know his Zack's assistant says, "Hey, come out to meet Zack." So I go out to meet Zack and. I get there a little late, and in my head, I'm like, oh, I hope Zach isn't one of those Hollywood directors like, if you're five minutes late, you're fired kind of thing. So I got there kind of late. He was in the middle of a meeting, and I thought he was talking to other storyboard artists, right? Because I, you know, here's the thing. On, on animated shows, you have anywhere from three to nine storyboard artists, you know, per show, you know, because, uh, you know, we do it episodic. So, again, this is my first live action film, so I figured there must be a lot of storyboard artists. So I show up there. He's in a meeting, so I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm late. But uh, but Zach sees me, tells the people around the table, okay, well, let's talk later. They leave. He walks over to me and he says, "Hi, I'm Zach Snyder." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know who you are." And then he's like, uh, "He's like, have you read the script?" And I'm like, "I haven't read anything." So uh, so then Zach's like, "Okay." So he then proceeds to take me around this you know this area where ha- that has all of the concept art for Man of Steel hanging up, and he pitches me, just me the entire movie from the beginning of Krypton all the way to the end. And, uh, oh, wow. and I tell this story and I'm like, I must've been dreaming. This is, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I find out that those guys he was talking to weren't other storyboard artists. It was just me that was going to help him because the thing with Zach is that he normally storyboards his films himself, right? Yeah. All of his other films, he's pretty much done it himself. He might need help here and there, but for this one, uh, he, you know, we, they were going to be shooting. Okay, this was in about May. They were going to start shooting probably in August. So, um, you know, time was running out, and he had to do a lot more prepping and stuff. And he doesn't didn't have time to draw. So that's why he reached out to Tim Miller and said, "Hey, I need some help." And here's the here's the funny thing: Zach didn't know that I was a director doing the animated stuff. He had hired me sight unseen, purely based on Tim Miller's recommendation. So he didn't even know who I was, you know, like, yeah. and which was great because what was funny is that I didn't realize that until it was about, uh, it was, it was in June. It was around the time that they, uh, um, it, yeah, it was about, it was before they went to Chicago. It was a couple weeks before, like beginning of June and him and I were drawing, like, you know, I would just go to his place and we would draw storyboards of sequences. Uh, but he used to do a thing where he would, he would, he would just give me like, uh, these are my storyboards. Can you just flesh it out? So I was like, okay. Um, because that's kind of how a lot of storyboards work. A lot of times in live action, the director just kind of gives them either a shot list or they have kind of their rudimentary storyboards, which Zach usually does, which he's used to doing. He just has, uh, you know, his storyboards and, uh, and he hands it off to a board artist or a concept artist and flesh it out or paint it out. So he was, for the longest time, that's what we were doing. Cause so I did the, uh, the Smallville fight. Um, I was doing the, you know, I think the first thing might've been the, the save where Lois is falling in the capsule and Superman flies down and, and rips out the door and, and catches her just as the thing crashes. And then they, 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 they float down into the cornfield. I think that was one of the first boards I did. So anyways, I was doing the Smallville fights. So I was doing the scene where, uh, 
Superman, he's got to Zod, and he's he's he, it's right after he he hit he he Zod has Martha, and then Superman comes in and hits him, and then they start battling all the way towards you know downtown Smallville. But I remember we were drawing, uh, I was drawing some stuff, and he was drawing some of his sequences, and we just started humming the you know the Superman theme, you know da 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 da, da right, and uh, and we started humming it, and then he turns to me, he's like, yeah, we can't use that. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, they don't, they want something brand new for this. I was like, oh, that's. That's a shame. And then uh, that was a time when um, you know, I was working on it. And I think that's when he realized that I had done the anime stuff. And I told him, like, yeah, Zach, I do, you know, I, I, this is, I've done superheroes for the last 10 years, you know, for Marvel and, and DC. And I noticed that after that, after that conversation, it kind of changed our relationship. Because instead of him just giving me shots, he would just tell me, like, this is what I'm thinking. Let me see what you do. And I would just do it, you know? Uh, and, and the pinnacle of that kind of relationship, I knew it was good was when he would come up with an idea and he'd turn to me. He's like, does that sound cool? What does that sound like? And I'd be like, yeah, that sounds cool. Or I'd be like, Hey, that's great, but maybe we should try this or, you know, how about this? And, Cause the thing is this, is that, you know, whenever I work with a live action director or even other directors or producers, um, I always tell them up front, I'm like, listen, like, I'm a director too, so you can bounce ideas off of me. I, 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 I speak the same language, but you're the boss. I'm going to follow your direction. So uh, however you want to steer the ship, I will adjust to do that because I've done that with all of the kind of productions and shows that I've done in the animation, and it's not so hard for me to do that. So I want to do your vision because I don't want them to feel threatened by me because there are some directors who will feel threatened by me because, you know, I kind of know my stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it in the most respectful way where it's like, okay, you know what, you might need a reaction shot here, or what about this, you know? And again, they're the boss, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I, I expect that of my own crew, so when I have, you know, artists under me, I expect them to follow my lead, even though maybe they may not agree or whatnot, but, you know, I'm the director, or I'm the producer, so they should, you know, I, it's the chain of command thing. Yeah. But it was really, it was really kind of eye-opening when Zach was kind of, uh, throwing ideas off of me and we were just kind of riffing and stuff. And I felt at that point, I felt it was more like a collaboration and how great it was. That fact that he didn't feel like every idea had to come straight from him. You know, he, this is why like working with him and talking to people on his crew who a lot of them have worked with him for many productions and they all love him. I mean, they all, anytime they always say, anytime Zach calls me, I put it down. I put, I, 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 I jump onto whatever production he's, he wants me on because they love him that much and the fact that he respects everybody's work and he knows it's a collaboration. And, and that's why like on man of steel, like, you know, I, I think that's where that friendship kind of, kind of built up and trust uh, because, you know, I, I, I trusted him with the ideas of, you know, the things that like, for example, the, the ending for man of steel, um, it was written a certain way that Nolan had written Goyer but we were trying to figure out like how do we kind of really culminate into something that's so bombastic that you know never been done before and so uh for example i remember this meeting really clearly it was myself dj who was a vfx uh supervisor damon caro who's the second unit director also the fight choreographer and zach and we basically we had a whiteboard and we just started we started writing down the kind of like main points of the fight okay we want this to happen this happens this happened uh, but then as we were, as they were coming up with ideas, I would tell Zach, you know, Zach, we, you know, in animation, we kind of did that already. And, and then I would kind of show him there's a scene from Superman, uh, all-star Superman that we did something similar to that. And he's like, huh, okay. Then we'd come up with some other ideas and I'd be like, you know what? We did that already. And this other thing. And I remember Zach was like, wow, you guys did, you guys already did all the cool stuff already. And I tell him, well, I mean, like, there's been a lot of animated Superman stuff that has been mined, but I told him, if you want, I could come up with something that has only been seen in anime and has never been done in live action. And even I couldn't even do in animation because uh, the tastes of like Warner Brothers or Disney or whatever, uh, not Disney, but uh, Marvel, they tend to go a little bit safer on the way that they want their animated fights to be. But I, but for me, I was always been a fan of anime. You know, I grew up with Akira and Ghost in the Shell and all that kind of stuff. So, and Dragon Ball Z, of course. I. I had always, uh, so I pitched the idea to Zach, I'm like, why don't we make this something like, that you only see an anime with timing and the, the kind of like, you know, mass um, destruction, so to speak, which a lot of people ended up hating. But for me, it was always like Superman is Superman. Like, what if gods were fighting in a metropolitan city? There's, there's, it's going to look 
like that. And that's why I wanted to really that. And, and fu- I mean, it's funny because ever since then, even with all the Marvel films and, and everything that's come out since then, there's no end superhero fight that I think is that big in scope. If you really kind of no, look actually, at it, uh, uh, completely you know, and, and, and so I, uh, you know, I, I, I pitched to him. They liked the idea. So that I went and they're like, uh, the, so I went back and I, and I did an animatic of it. So I drew it all out. I timed it out. I threw some music on it just to kind of show him like, this is what I'm thinking. And then a week later I show it to him and he's like, he liked it a lot. Uh, he then brought in all of the ADs and uh, the the rest of the crew. He's, he's like, Jay, play it. So I play it. They, they look at each other and they're like, we've never seen this before ever. And Zach's like, yeah, it's cool, huh? And then, and then, uh, and then he, then like about, I'm even an hour later, he comes in again, but it's all the producers. And then Zach's like, play it again. I was like, okay. So I hit play. The producers look at each other and they're like, how are we going to pay for this? And I'm like, oh, oh, do you want me to cut it? Do you want me to cut it? Down? And Zach's like, no, we're, we'll find the money, you know? And, uh, and yeah, and that's, that's, and that's how that end fight sequence came about, you know? And yeah. of course there was, uh, a lot of other kind of contributions. So Damon Caro had done his version of, of the fight as well that we integrated into the into the what I had done. But like I said, when you watch it, it's it's a seamless, it's a really cool fight that 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 is a great capper to that action field, you know, act three. You know, it's a yeah. really big act three if you only look at it. Yeah, I mean uh just to preface that I mean Man of Steel is personally my favorite superhero film still. Like and Superman's my favorite superhero. So uh, like my whole life, like I grew up with, like we mentioned Bruce Tim a lot. Like I grew up with Bruce Tim's work as my foundation. Where uh-huh. Superman the animated series was like my everyday show to watch, and then same thing with Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. So I really grew up with his Superman. And then as I um, got into college, that's my sophomore year of college is right when Man of Steel came out. So that was just uh, completely blew my mind. And same thing, like. The second when you're watching it, I got Dragon Ball Z vibes. Like when I was watching the <laughs> yeah. final fight. I'm glad you got that because yeah. I mean, that was my whole thing. I was like, you know what? I've, I've only seen something like this in anime. And I told Zach and his his guys, I'm like, out of all the people in Hollywood that could pull this off, you guys, I think, it, can do this. And and I just, you know, like I said, I gave him the proof of concept in terms of I like, drew it out, I animated it out, storyboarded it all out, and said, this is what I'm thinking. This is This is the... The madness I see in my in my head that I think the audiences are really gonna kind of like they're not gonna expect it. They're gonna expect you know the Superman two fight, you know, and we're gonna give them something that up to that point, even till now, no superhero has really done that kind of uh, you know as big and bombastic as that fight sequence that ended up being. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the action was uh, amazing, and you know, coming off of Superman Returns, where Superman, I don't think he. Even- Lifted his hand. He didn't throw anything. I think the most coolest thing he did was just the the plane thing was the best thing in the beginning. But then after that, what did he do? There's a a bullet that bounced off his eyeball, and then he lifted a continent made out of kryptonite. He he didn't throw a punch. He got him. Yeah. So So, I think yeah. yeah, So to see the action in Man of Steel was just like finally you get to see Superman in his full power, you know, full force. It was just amazing. Uh All right. So let's jump to the next question, Samir. You want you ask something? Yeah, so uh, after Man of Steel, you also did uh, work with um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like you said, uh, mm-hmm. Spider-Man Homecoming, uh, but you also did Ant-Man and Thor Ragnarok. So do you feel there's a difference when you're working with uh, DCEU and the MCU? Uh, I mean, it, the only difference is just, I mean, it's like with any film, like the, the directors you work with and how the studios run, it's all different. I mean, uh, for here's the thing, with storyboards and live action, at least my my kind of experience is that I work directly with the directors, so I don't really get involved with studio politics or, or anything. I just, my, my, my goal as a story is to realize the director's vision. And so I'm working directly with them one-on-one, Taika and the different directors. Um, I was able, so the difference with, for example, uh, with Marvel was that when, on Thor Ragnarok, I would pitch my storyboards to Kevin Feige as well, and I would and I would try to you know I would, I would show him like this is how uh, the sequence would be, and I would get notes from him, and I would address that as on top of whatever Taika's notes were. So um, whereas in Warner Brothers, it was mostly I was just pitching to Zach, and if Zach needed to get any kind of approvals or whatever, then he would fight that fight on his own, 
uh, without me having to pitch anything. I would, he would have my boards, but I was never involved. That, again, that's, that's above my pay grade at that point. Uh, so both, both experiences working on both shows were, it's just like when I was working on DC animation and Warner Brothers animation, I mean, uh, Warner Brothers animation and Marvel animation. It was very similar. I mean, it's, it's the same work, action stuff, different kind of superheroes. Uh, so for me, they were both very positive. I, they were both really, you know, good experiences and, and uh, let me think. The only thing that was a little different is maybe, um, well, on the on the Warner, I mean, on the Marvel films, there was a crew of of storyboard artists. So, so it wasn't just myself. There was maybe three, four, or five, sometimes even more than that, doing doing the whole movie. Whereas on Zach shows uh, movies. It was usually just me or maybe one or two other uh, storyboard artists, but usually it was just me because, like I said, Zach usually does it all himself, which is why Justice League I didn't really work on much except for doing um, last-minute stuff because by the time Zach started shooting, he had it all storyboarded out, so he didn't really call me, and I was really kind of sad. But then at the time, I was working on The Flash show with uh, Rick from Uiwa, and I was already prepping to start with Ben Affleck on his thing, but then I get a call, say, and Zach's like, hey, we've got some additional scenes can you help me out but i'm in london can you fly out here and of course i told zach anytime you need me you know fly i'll, I'll, I'll come you know and so i uh, got on a plane and i and i did those you know i did a couple sequences for justice league got to be on set which was cool um but but yeah usually it just depends the, usually uh with the dc films zach is he has it all kind of figured out whereas the marvel films there's a lot of different artists that contribute to to the overall but you'd also work with patty jenkins right you worked on one Woman a little oh, bit yeah. well i also worked with before patty was hired i was working with michelle mclaren who was the original director for wonder woman so i was working with her too before she left and then i worked with patty oh nice nice one more you want to get the next one sure uh just moving on to uh batman v superman which was uh which is my personal favorite. Uh, <laughs> Good, cool. Walk through the storyboarding process for a film like that big, um, and how was it like working with Zach on that? Uh, that one was great. Well, that one was the one where I think I worked the longest with Zach because with Man of Steel, I was only working with him for let's see, from May to about September, so maybe about five months. Uh, with Justice League, I was only with Zach for maybe two months. And with uh, Batman v Superman, I was there for eight months. I, I was there from things. I remember I flew out to Detroit like the day after Thanksgiving, and I and then I was there till the following June. Uh, wow. So it was a long time. I was there through the polar vortex, and uh, yeah, it was interesting being there for the Detroit winter. Uh, but that was really cool because again, I, I got it was an extended time with Zach. Uh, we weren't in a super rush like we were with Man of Steel um, because we were just, you know, it was, we just started and we were gearing up to start shooting. Um, so it was it was a very different kind of experience. And also on that one, we had another storyboard artist. So my duties were, I didn't have to do everything. So I, I got kind of, I just worked on whatever Zach wanted me to work on. So I did the, the Batmobile sequence. I did a... a, a quite a few other like Batman and super, I did all the Superman saving the world sequences. Like he's, he's pulling the boat and saving the rocket, stuff like that. Um, and then, and then the other cool thing is we, 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 Zach and I would talk sometimes at length about, you know, how I adapted Dark Knight Returns and how in the live action version BVS, that very scene, how can we do it in a, in a similar way, but something that's kind of different as well. So, you know, like for example, the, the scene where, um, Batman saves Martha Kent, you know, and, and he comes to the wall and then gets the gun and shoots, uh, shoots the, the flamethrower tank, you know, because uh, I did that same scene in Dark Knight Returns, you know, just a little different than mutants. Uh, so it was stuff like that that we would talk and just be like, oh, how we do this, you know, and it was, it was interesting because the, the Batman Superman fight I didn't do, so I wasn't involved in that um, uh, because Damon and his guys had already worked that out. Uh, the the Doomsday fight I didn't do either. I did a lot of Act One, and Act Two stuff, but I didn't really do anything in the Doomsday fight at the end. I wanted to because I mean I would have I would have loved to do Wonder Woman, you know, the Wonder Woman fight. But like I said, I got to do Wonder Woman when I worked with Patty, and so I got to do my Wonder Woman kick there. Nice. I mean, and what was like your personal favorite film? Like, uh, from actually, a two part question to me: What was your personal favorite film to work on, and what was your personal favorite film? 
as a film, as a fan yourself, because as we all know, you grew up with this. You were in uh, love with Batman since reading The Dark Knight Returns uh, so many years ago. So like, you, now that you're living the life and you're kind of creating these stories for new generations of fans, like how is that? Like when you put yourself back in the fan chair, how do you see that work? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, again, uh, with live action films, I would have to say Man of Steel is probably my most favorite. Um, even though it was a short stint for me, you know, the five months I was working on it, but uh, it was magic because, uh, you know, all I had to do was convince Zach of, hey, this would be cool if we tried this, you know, why don't we try this? And and there wasn't any kind of studio oversight, at least from my kind of perspective. I, mean, I don't know the whole story, but, you know, uh, I remember asking Zach when we were trying to, when we were changing the ending of Man of Steel or just, you know, reworking it. And I asked him, like, do we need to clear this with anybody? Like, do we have to send it back to the studio? Because, you know, anything huge when I do my animated stuff, I always have to kick it up to my executives, like, you know, Bruce Tim or whatever, uh, to finally, for the producers to kind of be like, okay, let's, that's okay if we could change it. You know, if it's something huge, if, you know, little stuff, they don't really care so much, but something big that might need some kind of approval. But I remember Zach telling me, he's like, well, he's like, if I want it in there, it's going to be in there. I was like, Okay, cool. So that's why we got what we got, you know, and I thought that was great. Um, as soon as we got to BVS and and definitely on Justice League, I, I, there would be like check-ins with the studio. I remember like, you know, if there's any kind of new changes to the script, especially with Justice League, that we it had to be sent back. I remember seeing that, oh, there were some changes and they had to get approvals and, and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and I remember... Uh, uh, there was uh, the, the sequence that I was kind of doing, which was the Themyscira stuff on Justice League. I remember I added some stuff, and and there uh, and I remember Jeff John was there, and I was having dinner with Jeff Johns, and he's like, he's like, he's like, I don't think we need this, and I told Jeff, like, no, it'll be cool. Trust me, it'll be really cool if we, you know, I was like, it, 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 it it's gonna be something cool visually, um, but. You know, I remember that like there were more execs involved and more kind of studio involvement when I was working on the later films than than in that first one. The first one for me was like magic because it was just, like I said, it was it was it was it was just Zach and I and and Damon and DJ just collaborating, trying to be like let's just make something really cool, you know, something that we we've never seen before on film, and that's that's how it is. And then and then like I said, BVS, we it wasn't as kind of strict. I mean, it wasn't as loose, so. There were some a little bit kind of like, hey, just be aware of this, you know, because remember at that time there was the whole, you know, uh, all the all of the articles of like DC films are colorless and this and that. And, you know, <laughs> you know how it is. It's like one person says it, and then everybody just mimics it as if it's like the gospel truth and yeah. nobody understands that, you know, that's that's called color correction. Or that's there's every film has a palette. If you look at Saving Private Ryan and to, you know, how to lose a guy in 10 days or whatever, like they all have a color palette and that's the director's choice. And, and yeah. with, because of the uh, tone of the film, Zach chose this color palette, but they, of course, they think that it's just like, oh, it's colorless and now like it's dark, you know? And, and again, it just turns into this whole, like, uh, not, not understanding what the filmmakers were trying to do with the film. What was, what was your kind of reaction to, um, the critical reception of the theatrical cut when it came out, uh, also the of, edition of BVS or Man of Steel. Uh, yes, about uh, um, you know, I was ex see, I I had got to see BVS at uh, an early uh, cast and crew showing, like the premiere. We we did it at the Warner lot. You know, they had like you know hors d'oeuvres. They had all of the like Batmobile and all the props there. So, and I saw it then. I saw it a couple weeks before. Uh, the, you know the big release and i was ecstatic because for me it just reminded me of a live act i mean it just it reminded me of a live action version of my director videos you know i mean the director video stuff that i've been working on i've done you know i've done uh eight at the time i think uh so just the the way that it felt in terms of you know like the, you know this is the next progression this is the next you know chapter in from man of steel i thought wow it just feels like you know in tone with the the director video stuff that i've been working just of course with a bigger budget and a lot more themes woven in you know because my my stuff is made for you know 13 and up kids where zach tries to you know layer it so that kids can you know kind of enjoy it for what it is but then there's adults can do it I mean, it's a little bit more of an adult 
uh, kind of uh, geared audience because I tell people where they're like, well, I want my, I want to watch my Superman with my five-year-old. I'm like, well, you know, there's Superman, the animated series you can watch. There's a ton of Superman stuff that's appropriate for your kid's age. You don't have to watch Man of Steel, at least not right now. Like there was a lot of stuff I grew up on that I couldn't watch until I got older. I mean, that's just life, you know, it's growing up. There's a reason why it's called PG-13 or R or, you know, G-rated. Um, and for me, you know, what Zach was doing, it, it, it fit into the different, into the filmography of the other Supermans, you know, like, you know, if you want that kind of family friendly thing, you could watch the Christopher Reeves ones, or you could watch the George Reeves one, uh, the Superman Returns ones, a different kind of audience, you know, I mean, uh, that's, that's where like, you know, it, it deals with a Superman who, who has daddy issues or so to speak, you know, um, and, and it's something that has never been tackled before. It's very akin to how a lot of people hated Damian Wayne when they introduced him, but when I was doing my animated films on the, the, the same with the son of Batman stuff, uh, I, I, at the beginning, I didn't really like Damian Wayne, but then James Tucker took me aside and he's like, well, this is basically who Damian Wayne is. He's basically a young Bruce, Tim, I mean, a, a young Bruce Wayne, sorry. He's a young Bruce Wayne. <laughs> so he's kind of an asshole, you know, uh, because he's a kid who basically he's been trained to kill you, but because of what, you know, his father is trying to teach him. He's trying to teach him to not become a monster. Uh, but the way he is, he's, he's cocky. I mean, if you were like, if you were Bruce Wayne in the body of a kid with all the same knowledge, of course you'd be cocky. And that's kind of how he described, this is how, you know, the take of, of Damien. And I was like, okay, that now I get it. So then when I did my films, that was the same thing. So that's why with the Superman Returns thing, I like the idea of, for me, it was more about, okay, they were trying a different take. They were trying to do Superman as a father. And it, you know, for me, it's not really my thing, but you know, a lot of people like those films, and that's why with the Man of Steel one, for me, it was a it was a, a kind of refreshing take on something that we all knew and love. You know, you know, uh, I like the fact that when I first heard that they were going to do a, a a reboot, I was like, oh, I don't want to see Smallville again. I don't want to see him running through the fields and seeing Pa Kent get a you know. Uh, a heart attack and all the things that, again, that I'd seen in the Reeves one that I loved and I don't really want to see it again. It's the same thing way I felt when, when Sony rebooted Spider-Man over and over again. And I just thought, I don't need to see uncle Ben die. Can we just start with him being Spider-Man? Like I get, everybody knows that it's that, you know, power responsibility thing. Can I not see another version of uncle Ben dying? So when I, when I read the script, uh, for Man of Steel, I was like, this is awesome because you don't see those. You, it's almost like one of my favorite films from the 80s is Highlander, right? And it was reminding me of that where they did these flashbacks. So you would have your, your narrative yeah, going and every now and then you'd flash back to key moments that were relevant to the story at that point. And that's what how I felt Man of Steel was a lot, you know, they did some of these flashbacks and this. So I thought, wow, this is, this is kind of a great, you know, Elseworlds version of Superman that, you know, for the new generation, but it's still reverent to the source material, but it gives you something new, which is why when we did the fight sequence, I wanted to kind of up it, up it than what we saw in anything, you know? Um, and so that's why with BVS, you know, even though, you know, we were riffing on the Dark Knight Returns, but we were basically saying that in this universe, we're we're finding a damaged Batman, a Batman who basically lost his groove, right? Uh, he's lost his way because Robin has been, you know, has been dead. He and and when and there's that line that Alfred said talking about cruel man and this and that, yeah. but it's really kind of cool how Zach shoots it because it's Bruce looking at footage of Superman, but 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 Alfred is looking right at Bruce, almost telling Bruce like, "No, I'm talking about you." But when you look at it. And, you know, for the common audience member, they might just be like, oh, he's just talking about Superman. And that's what feeds into Bruce's kind of like paranoia of who, who Superman is when, in fact, Alfred was just trying to, he's trying to, in his own way, trying to tell Bruce, you've lost your way, but he doesn't know, know how to quite tell him because, you know, Bruce is kind of a jerk at, at times. Uh, but I love the idea that he was, that Zach was weaving in the elements of the Dark Knight Returns as well as some other kind of stories to basically give Batman a character arc to go from a Batman that we don't know into the Batman that we will eventually know and love. And I thought, wow, that's great. You know, cause here's the thing, Dark Knight Returns isn't really canon. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. fit into the, yeah, the yeah. timeline of the Damian Wayne Batman or anything like that. The only thing, the only, only other Robin in that timeline was just Dick. Right. And, and so it's, it's one of those things like, um, you know, Killing Joke. Killing Joke might not be canon in some ways, but in some ways it is, you know, because Oracle and all that kind of stuff. But Dark Knight Returns is one of those, like, Elseworld stories that people love 
but doesn't really fit into you know the story of, of Batman. But Zack found a way to weave that into this new version, but we start with that, a, a damaged Batman, a Batman who has lost his way, who used to be fighting you know to clean up Gotham and, and for justice and stuff, but because of the death of Robin and, and, and everything that's happened since then, it, you know, guilt and everything kind of changed him. And then now, you know, aliens show up from, from the sky and destroy a city, and now one of them is, is is staying on the planet, who has powers to basically destroy everyone. Of course, somebody as paranoid as Bruce Wayne. I mean, if you're a Batman yeah. fan, you should know that Bruce Wayne is ultra paranoid. He's so very paranoid, you know, because he's the guy. He always wants contingencies. He always wants to be prepared, you know. And here is a guy flying in the sky without anything, and and Bruce is now, you know, rethinking his whole view on life because he's like. I, I've planned for every contingency, but I never planned for a god to be flying around who I can't technically harm whatsoever. And that, you know, piled in the fact that it's a Dark Knight Returns Batman, it it fuels into his kind of like, you know, obsession and paranoia about Superman. Also, the fact that you find out that Lex has kind of been nudging Batman to into the showdown with, you know, with Superman. So again, and there's all these things that I thought, Wow, this is this is some deep stuff. This is some great stuff. And when I saw it, I I loved it. I thought it was really great. Um, and then when I I started hearing the reviews or these people, what people didn't like about it, and people talking about Martha and this and that, and I thought, did they not understand what that whole point was? I mean, the whole reason why the movie starts with, um, you know, the death of his, uh, the death of Bruce's parents is to set up the fact that that traumatic effect has basically given uh, little Bruce. And now adult Bruce, PTSD, he's had it all his life. I mean, it's something that I even did in Dark Knight Returns, yeah, yeah. part one. I, I played with the fact that he has PTSD. If you notice, I do flashes when he, when he, when, you know, I, I try, when, when the train goes by overhead, it's flashing on the ground and that, and that gives him those flashes of when his mom gets killed and all. So I was at that early stage, I was really playing with the fact that you had a Batman who had PTSD, you know? Uh, and so Zach was just, he was setting that up. And if you watch that film, really, without having any kind of preconceived notions or whatnot, or, or, or just waiting for the Martha scene, um, he sets it up. So that way, at the end, when, when Batman's going to kill Superman, the Martha is the trigger to get, to, to, to get him out of, uh, to get Batman out of this kind of bloodless vengeance. Because in my head, again, I, I didn't talk to Zach about this, but in my head, I put together the fact that that um, the reason why he didn't say save my mom was that Clark already knew who who Batman was. Because remember, Clark's a he's, he's an investigative reporter. He already figured out who Bruce Wayne was. So, and I think he knew Bruce Wayne's past because everybody knows about the Waynes being murdered. And yeah. Of course, he may not know, but he knew. I think he he put two and two together and knew that it you know in order to get through to Bruce would be have to you know, appeal to, uh, you know, about you know, the, the word Ma uh, Martha, you know, the, about the name of his mom, who happens also to be the name of his mom, but he's trying to get through to this guy who, again, has in this bloodlust. Um, and for me, I, I, I saw that and I dug it. I was like, okay, yeah, that's cool. I mean, yeah, people say like, oh, they're both of their parents and uh, moms are named Martha. I was like, yeah, it's been that way for the last 75, 80 years. You just never noticed that. Like, yeah. you know, well, did you want us to change it to something else? Um, and uh, and so you know, I for me, I enjoyed I enjoyed it for what it was, and uh, you know, I was proud of be working about work, worked on it and worked and collaborated with Zach and and everything. And then I just for me, it was it was it was kind of undeserved the the kind of like critical response to it because, um, like I said, they fixated on 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 things that uh, they just read in a in a you know in a review and and somebody who was watching it wasn't paying attention or wasn't critical. I mean, it wasn't, he's the thing is that there are journalists who, who do their homework and they know how to critique a movie and review it. And then there are people who are like bloggers who just watch a movie and they give you their opinion. Yeah. Like, oh, I hate it because, you know, Superman didn't smile enough. I'm like, really? So <laughs> that, that, that's your whole point. You want him to smile a lot. And see, for me, again, a lot of these people, maybe they're not old enough to remember, but I remember a time when 
everything was all campy. You know, like I remember back with the the you know the, the original eighty nine Batman had some campy stuff. There was the whole Schumacher stuff. The I mean, all the old Batman films, and even to a point, a lot of the X Men films in the nineties, and, and and there was even a little campiness in the Blade film, which was the, the kind of the first kind of real superhero film to kind of you know be of modern times. Uh, there was a bit of campiness in it, and in that time. You know, remember, I was already in my 20s at that time, you know, almost in my 30s, that, you know, fans like me at the time were like, can you just give us a serious superhero film? Can we please get a serious superhero film? So fast forward, you get Man of Steel, and we finally do something. Basically, what we did was a science fiction superhero film. I mean, it was a sci-fi film. And it was serious, you know. I mean, uh, you don't have to have jokes. And again, uh, I'm not knocking what Marvel does or anybody else like Kick Ass or these other kind of comic book adaptations, because uh, I like those just as well. But the thing is, is that they finally, we finally got uh, a serious superhero film that takes these ser- these characters in a serious manner, as opposed to Super Friends, for example. And and it gets panned, you know, for trying to be serious. And I'm like, okay, well. When Batman the Animated Series came out, nobody panned it because it was different than Super Friends, you know, because those are two very different shows. Uh, they're just different takes on Batman. And and so, uh, you know, that's when I realized that, you know, a lot of the criticism was just unwarranted. It was just people yeah. just hating it because they wanted to be. They The thing is, we're in a climate now where people look at these DC and Marvel kind of rivalry as if it's like sports teams. No, and it's, it was never that way. You know what I mean, yeah. if you if you're if you are a true comic book fan, you remember going to the comic book store every Wednesday and buying DC. You bought Marvel. You bought Dark Horse. You bought anything that you liked. You didn't. You that you never thought about like, oh, why are you reading Marvel? Why are you reading? You know, nobody cared because they loved these characters. But it was only after you know the success of Iron Man and Marvel kind of. You know, doing a, you know, acquiring these new fans, and these new fans look down on anything else. So they're like, "Oh, Superman, he's so old, or he's so unrelatable. Oh, we don't like Batman, he's so this that." And they just never gave it a shot, and they never understood what these characters are. So now we have all these fans now who did, you know, grow up with the Marvel films, thinking that this is how it should be, claiming that any other version of superhero that doesn't follow these kind of, uh, you know, has to, they have to smile. There has to be a joke every five minutes or there has to be this, uh, the tone has to be like that. It's like, who are you to tell me how comic book movies should be? You know? I, yeah, mean, I mean, and here's the thing is that even though, you know, I have a pedigree of, I've collected comics in the past and I've read it and I've worked on these comic stuff, you know, as a filmmaker, I like to have a variety of stuff, you know, like, I, I still watch the, the Reeves stuff when I have it, when I feel like it, I'll watch the man of steel stuff. I'll watch, you know, uh, Avengers. I watch all these different things. It all depends on how I feel, and uh, but I like the fact that uh, on any given day I can watch a horror film. On any given day I'm gonna go watch, you know, an episode of Doctor Who, but I'm not gonna be like, oh, this sucks because it's not like Doctor Who. I'm like, it's like, <laughs> why are you comparing it? It doesn't. And yeah. here's the thing: is that like, why can't you know you just embrace the fact that there's other kind of superheroes out there? You know, there's this like. The DC superhero, this DC pantheon, is very different than the Marvel pantheon. And they're both both studios and both companies uh, characters are unique in that way. You know, the reason why for me Spider Man is my favorite character is because he's just a guy who ha- has superpowers, but he's not a millionaire. He has to like you know have a job and go to school and and you know and try to like go out on dates with Mary Jane and and but save the world. And for me, I like that because I, I thought it makes, to me, Peter's a more empathetic character than as opposed to Bruce Wayne, who's like, I've got, I'm a millionaire, haha, even though I'm, you know, I can get hurt, but I've got millions that I can just build myself an armor that will heal my back and I can go out fighting again, you know. So for me, I empathize a lot with Spider-Man. I, I, I like his storylines. I like the kind of stuff that he does. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I can't enjoy Batman or Superman, Wonder Woman exactly. or the X-Men. Because the moment X Men has a lot of the kind of racial undertones, and that was always part of the part of you know the, the kind of DNA of X Men. And I loved reading that stuff, you know, reading about Mutant Massacre and Genosha and, and the whole kind of um, kind of you know them fighting for social equality. And uh, but I liked it for that, you know. I wasn't like, well, why isn't this more like Superman or whatever, you know? What I mean, and that's the thing is that like. Uh, we're in a culture now where it's a us versus them thing. You know, like they, again, it's like yeah. we're these are sports teams, and I'm like, 
okay, but there is no winners. It's like, well, you know, if a movie comes out, a movie comes out. If you don't like it, don't watch it. It's cool. I think, a, yeah. You know? I think, I think the amazing thing about uh, Batman v Superman is that, uh, like, critical reception aside, there is a, I mean, that movie did well. Like, a lot of yeah. fans love that movie. And, and not just, um, not just DCEU kind of like, uh, like just those kind of centered around people. There's a lot of people that, um, that loved, uh, that loved, um, I'm going to be Superman for just, for just what it was. Um, and mm-hmm. even, you know, you talked about the Martha scene, the Martha scene, um, a lot of people did like it. And personally speaking, I think that scene was very, it, it gave Batman v Superman like a different kind of, it, like it made it unique in a in a in a sense, you know, uh-huh. like Batman kind of his whole arc and how that word, how Zach used that word, and 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 you know how he like becomes, well, slowly he starts to become who 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 we want him to be, who, who even the people that were complaining about him, um, that's the whole point, right? Is that he's he's lost his way. So I think that's the that's the greatness of of the film itself. And now you see people even three, four years later. I mean, if the movie wasn't good, why are people still talking about yeah, it? Yeah, still talking about it. And see, for me, my, the high point for me at that film was the scene when, when Superman looks at Lois and he says, you're my world. And then he flies off to fight Doomsday because he knows that he's going to die. Yeah. So was- for me, I got teared up at that point because what, for me, again, as a filmmaker, I, I, uh, I look back at all of the kind of, the arc that the, the, the breadcrumbs that Zach has laid out. Cause if you think about it, uh, young Clark just wanted to belong, you know, like, you know, he, when he found out that he was an alien, he's like, why can't I just be your son? You know? And, and so he's, he's already putting in the kind of seeds of a man who is not one of us who grew up in our culture, who, who grew to love being a human or mankind um, to to you know, saving you know, he's going around not trying you know putting on a tights and, and saving people. You know, he's trying to do it incognito because his father told him like the world is not ready for somebody like you. And and sure enough, it wasn't because look, as soon as he shows up, you know, uh, what happens? Like even in Batman v Superman, there's that whole people don't trust him and you know they they see him as a savior, sometimes they see him as a devil. There's all these kind of things that happen because again, the world it's like today's climate. Yeah, you know, if Superman shows up, realistic, today, realistic, gonna, realistic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, people would be like, "Screw that guy! I ain't gonna listen to some alien." Or and and the thing is, is that it was it was a reflection of what of our culture today. And I think a lot of people didn't want to see that. They didn't want to see that mirror to of what is kind of happening. But I love the fact that we when we get to Batman v Superman, Clark finally gets what he wants. He gets acceptance, at least from the woman that he loves. You know, like remember, uh, he was kind of a loner for most of his life. So when when he meets Lois and and their love in uh, Batman v Superman, he finally gets except he finally gets what he wants at least a, a, a sense of belonging, which is why again he wanted he was they were gonna get married and everything. So that's why at the very end when he looks back at her, it, to me it was heartbreaking because of the fact that yeah. he's giving up every now that he's finally got everything he wanted in terms of belonging and and you know all this kind of he has to give it up and he's giving it up. To save us all, you know, and that's why, and that's what, that's what really what changes Batman. He sees that he knows, he sees the sacrifice that this guy, in order to save us all, after he, he could have easily just, you know, gone, you know, flew away or flew, got Lois and went away and just let Doomsday destroy Metropolis or whatever, whatever. But, you know, he gave up everything, basically everything in his life, which was just Lois. Yeah, exactly. exactly. He gave that all up. You know, and to me, I was like, "Oh, I got so choked up at that." You know, I was like, "That to me, it was a beautiful arc for Superman." It really, that was, yeah, that 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 part was really crazy. Even Zimmer's score and and that yeah. that part is crazy. I just wanted to say, by the way, that the um, I don't know if you worked on on Beautiful Eye, the first scene in the movie. I thought that was like we've seen that we've seen uh, Bruce Wayne's parents die like a million times, but oh yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't do that. That one's actually yeah, I, I like that Zimmer's, scene a lot. But Zimmer's score and just the way it was shot was just crazy. I, I oh, no, it's, it's there and I was like, what the hell? Like, this is some crazy, crazy crap. So I just wanted to say that we definitely love the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Actually, yeah, just oh, to jump off Umar's okay. point, actually. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I actually had a chance to write uh, an article for a comic book debate. I'll, even, I'll link it to you uh, after this. It was called, like, The Ultimate Immigrant Story, uh, Zack Snyder's uh-huh. Superman. And I actually had a chance to share it with Zack. On Vero, and he he told me that 
a big part of his intention for the film was to kind of embed that immigrant story into Man of Steel and Batman v Superman in terms of like Superman being this alien and how that works, especially in uh, today's society. And you were mentioning how yes. like uh, everyone is like fearing him and how that's there's a lot of social uh, contemporary like lines you can draw, especially in, uh, I'm, I don't know if you did this scene in particular, the scene where he's going down uh, in Washington and everyone's holding up the signs. <laughs> Uh, did you oh yeah, that? yeah. That, uh, Zach had done that one, but I, I remember seeing the storyboards for that. It's basically what you saw. Like he had, he already knew what how he wanted to present that. Yeah. So exactly, and that scene, uh, you can draw so many parallels to kind of like uh, the Muslim immigrant experience, which is what I was writing about in my article. Exactly. And Zach uh, right away understood what I was trying to tell him, and uh, I just said a very nice guy. He responded and said, you know, this was his intention and stuff like that. So I mean, like huh? just to say, like the four of us, especially, we're huge Zack Snyder fans. I mean. You could probably tell that from our audience and kind of like the kind of things we tweet about. Like, it's a big part of uh, what we do is his films inspiring us. So that's a big part. And but uh, same thing with you, you working with him, you could see your impact on the thing. And especially you see the Man of Steel fight, you see like your impact on that, and you gave more insight today on that as well. So let's just move forward uh, sure. again yeah, to the whatever next. Whatever you guys got, let me know. Yeah. What, you, what, what else you got? Yeah. So the next one, I mean, this is. Uh, the big topic, a lot of people are asking about it, you know, a lot. And it's basically uh, the Snyder Cut. My breakfast, what I had for no. breakfast. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that was, I was going to get to that question also. But, that was yeah, going to be our last question. I was going <laughs> to save it for the end. <laughs> but uh, I was going to ask about uh, Justice League. And you said that you worked uh -huh. on some parts of it. Obviously, you flew out to London and you got a chance to be hands-on with the film uh, on particular. But uh, as you can tell, the Snyder Cut is such a divisive topic uh in the fandom in the media in the comic book media space basically uh which we operate uh -huh. in and um i mean it, i think it's very obvious that the snyder cut is real and it exists and you tweeted in uh -huh. support of it multiple times and uh so have we but i think uh just one more time for everybody i know like we made a joke with larry fong on the previous podcast that people take lines out of our podcast and make it into articles, stuff like that. So this guarantees people be pulling quotes you say today and making it into tomorrow's news article. So uh, do you have anything you want to say about the Snyder Cut and like just the validity of it, again, to just give it to the people who are still in doubt? I mean, the thing about the Snyder Cut is that, you know, Zach... You know, he's not one of those directors who builds the movie in, in the edit room. Like, it's all storyboard out. It's all planned out. So every single shot that he had planned for the film is in there. There are some times where there might be some reshoots, but a lot of those reshoots happen because of executive notes. So uh, there are probably various versions of Zach's cut. I mean, from the time they finished principal photography in December or January, um, there's already that cut. You know, of course, then he then goes in and they start editing it down, you know, to get it closer to the length that they need it to be. Uh, but there are versions of it. And so now I've seen, it's now semantics, right? People saying they're talking about, like, oh, Jay Oliva's just talking about an assembly cut. That's so different than a Snyder cut. And I'm like, well, you know what? There's an Oliva cut of Dark Knight Returns. Same thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it just, it just didn't have all the, you know, didn't have the, uh, the, the ADR in it or something, but... I still have cuts of my different films. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist or that it's not watchable. Uh, but the the thing is, is that, um, you know, we are at this state in the DC films or, or because of a very vocal minority that, that basically from the get-go, no matter what Zack and company did, uh, we're going to hate it. You know what I mean? Uh, which is why... You know, the whole thing about it's being colorless, Superman doesn't save anybody, yeah, he doesn't smile, or or million, the whole thing about it, millions of people died in Metropolis, you know, and, and they made that a big deal. And I'm like, well, didn't they do the same thing in Avengers? Didn't like, yeah. you know, there was a huge fight in Avengers. I never noticed that. But again, it's, it's, it's fitting these people, these vocal minorities' narrative to uh, kind of, you know, it, to kind of get that clickbait, you know, because because again, if they get if they have an article that be, that's trending, guess what? They get more clicks on their site and they get more revenue. And I you know I can't knock them. I mean, you get money from it, but at the same time, you know, 
what they inadvertently was trying to do in terms of getting revenue basically changed the face of all superhero films. So now, if you like I mentioned in a tweet before, that you know, I watch a Marvel film and now they have to go out of their way to explain that the the, the city has now been evacuated. You know, there's always that line, it's a good thing there's nobody living here, right? And yeah. I'm just like, okay, now that's just a cop out. Now that turns into Saturday morning cartoons, you know, like e even when I do my movies and stuff, I don't even do that, you know, like because that was stuff that we did back in the '80s and '90s. We're like, hey, this that's if it's a good thing, that, you know, we were able to evacuate everybody just in time before you know Doomsday came through here. And again, it's like that's not how real life works, yeah. you know. Like when when emergencies happen, there's innocence involved, of course. But at the same time, you know, it's part of the narrative. The superheroes have to save people. They save us. We have to be, the, you know, the, humanity has to be in trouble and has to be on a global scale to the reason why we have these, these powerful beings to fight for us. And that's the whole point of superhero films, you know. It's been that way in the comics. It's been that way in the cart, at least the, the anime stuff that I've worked on. Uh, but the idea is that... Uh, this vocal minority, you know, and because of social media, it gained traction, and it's and it's changed the way these films eventually became out. So that's why, you know, with uh, the last movie of Justice League, that is that is a studio listening to what apparently the fans and quotes wanted, you know. Yeah. But again, nobody came out to watch it. You know, it's like yeah, it's like me saying, you know, what I really want, I really want a blue. Uh, blue Pepsi, and I and I and I and I, you know, parade, and I say I want a blue Pepsi, I want a blue Pepsi, and I get all my friends, and it becomes a big thing, and finally, Pepsi is like, all right, we're gonna make a blue Pepsi, but I don't go out and buy one, you know, and what is that? I mean, that's basically what happens. That these people were just parading that they were like, we want this, we want, and they never went out to watch it, you know, they had no intention of ever supporting what whatever DC or Warner Brothers did, you know, and the problem with that though, then it it alienates the fans who did like the stuff that Zach did. You know what I mean? And like I said, it's okay to like Marvel and DC. Again, hell, I work on both of those films. I enjoy working on both both of those franchises. But as a filmmaker, I can see that from the inside. I'm I'm seeing notes from executives. I'm seeing notes, you know, that's trickled down all the way to animation where people are, are so afraid of, oh, um, we can't do that. So, for example, back uh, during 9-11, you know, when the two Twin Towers went down, for – a lot of years after that, you could not have buildings collapse in anything, in animation and in, in films, or whatever, because again, it's very traumatic. So that changed the course of a lot of things. And so people were very like, you know, uh, handling that kind of thing with kick gloves. And I understand that, you know, visually it's, it's very traumatic because it's a real event. But like I said, moving forward in these superhero films, what happens is that what this vocal minority has done is basically tied the hands of, of any kind of future stories being told. Because now we have to, if we do have any kind of uh, conflicts or fights or whatever, we have to ensure that the common citizens are safe and that, you know, uh, you know that basically they're fighting in a remote area constantly. And, but the thing is, as a writer, like that's, what if you want to do it? What's that? What if that is the... What if that is part of your story? That's a tenant of your story that you're doing a fight through a crowded area. Now, mind you, you don't you don't kill people gratuitously, but you have to do a thing like this is what superheroes have to deal with: that they are constantly fighting supervillains in a metropolis. L look at Incredibles too; like those action sequences were still surrounded with people running around. But I didn't see any articles saying, "Oh wow, what about those CG people? Why didn't you know? I hope they're okay." And I didn't see any articles on that, and I still love The Incredibles too. But they—they're like, no, we're gonna. This is what it's gonna look like—a runaway train down a down a you know a, a crowded city. There's, you know, this is there's, this is what's at stake. You know, the, this is it, it ramps it up for the superhero that not only do they have to stop this train or whatever they have to do, but they have to do it in such a way that innocents don't get killed. You know, and it makes it even harder. But that's why they're called superheroes. You have to make it so that you know. The random, you know, hero like a cop or firefighter, or you know, uh, an ex, uh, you know, somebody in the military can't do themselves. That's why there is something of a superhero. That's why we call them superheroes, um, because we have heroes every day. And that's the thing is that this this whole movement uh, for the Snyder Cut was basically trying to keep the artistic integrity of what these filmmakers want, good or bad. You know, what I mean, like there are some directors that I don't really like their versions of, you know, the comic book stuff or, or properties that I love, but it's okay. You know, I mean, 
I still love the property, but I just don't maybe care for their film. No, but I that's fine. That. You know, yeah. it's not like it's not like you know that director's coming to my house and and waking me up in the middle of the night and say, "Watch me, you know, watch this." Uh, and that's fine. And and I tell people like, if you're that passionate about, you know, this is your this is the only version of this particular superhero, then that's cool. I mean, you can be passionate about it, but you know what? Why don't you take that energy and do what I did, and make those films. You know, and, yeah, exactly. And, and instead of instead of just sitting back and being a you know armchair quarterback, why don't you do it? You know, I mean, uh, there's no. I again, I've been doing this about 23 years now. You know, and again, I I was very fortunate in you know in, in the way that my career went in, that turned into. But whenever I was given an opportunity to do something that kind of changed the industry or changed a certain way, I took it. You know, and I, you know, whether people loved it or not, it's fine. But you know what? I took that chance and I did what I felt that I wanted to see these characters do. You know, in my head, I always want, when I was a kid, I used to have my Darth Vader figure and my Spider-Man figure. And I'd figure out fight sequences, like how does Spider-Man fight Darth Vader, you know? And that's what I'm just doing now because I'm in that position. And, you know, when I'm long gone and, you know, I'm no longer here, my films will survive. And I hope that the generations who come after me who've seen my films are inspired by that and then take the torch and, and further along because that's what these iconic heroes have done for the last 80 plus years is that uh, filmmakers and creatives, uh, artists, writers have all different versions of these superheroes and and they're all valid. There's different versions of Superman that's all through. If you read Superman from Action Comics 1 all the way to now, you'll realize that there's a lot of different versions of Superman. Same thing with Batman, Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, all of these guys. But that's what's so great about these characters, that they're iconic because they're up for interpretation. And my interpretation of The Dark Knight Returns, even though people say it's so you know uh, uh, close to the source material, it's still just my interpretation. You know, And I'm just kind of riffing off of what, what Frank, he started. He passed the torch to me. And I had to bring it. I had to knock it out of the park, you know. And I wasn't trying to say this is going to replace Frank Miller's graphic novel. No, this is supposed to go in conjunction with it. Like for people who read the comic and is a fan of it, you know, I have this thing for people to enjoy in a different medium. You know, just like if there was an audio book of The Dark Knight Returns, it doesn't mean that it takes anything away from my movie or from Frank's movie. It's just a different way of of enjoying this classic story. This very riveting story uh and like i said years from now they might do another version of the dark knight returns they might do a live action version and i would love that you know I would, I'm, i'd be in line to see that too uh, exactly and that's yeah. the thing no, i i feel 100 percent, and i think samir you can jump in right now if you have a question on him. oh yeah um did you see the theatrical version of just the game what do you uh, yeah. think about uh, when I saw the theatrical version of Justice League, uh, I saw it in the theaters. For me, I thought it was okay. I mean, I didn't hate it, but, uh, you know, I didn't know a lot of the things that were going on behind the scenes. I just knew that, you know, what happened with uh, Zach's family and he had to step away and Joss taking over. So when I saw the film, uh, th there was a lot of things that I was not really quite confused because, again, the draft that I had worked on was very different. and. And so motivations of certain characters, you know, certain things were can, can you very different it? than I expected. Um, so when I saw it, I thought yeah, it was okay. I, I didn't love it, but, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean everything I work on I love. But uh, I wanted, I really was curious about, like, where was all the stuff that, that, uh, that I had known, that I, that I knew that was planned, where was all that, you know, and, and that's, and that's all, I mean, again, at that time, I had never really thought about the Snyder Cut movement or anything like that. It was just, I went to go see it because again, I worked on it and I was just excited to see what the next chapter was. Can you, can you speak on like the specifics of how different it was, what you had planned? I mean, I know Zach shared a lot of storyboards of like dark side and things like that, that obviously were missing from the theatrical cut. Uh -huh. So can you speak on some of like the big things if you can, if you're allowed to? Uh, I can't really speak about that. I mean, most of the thing I can say is that, uh, I mean, some of this, a lot of the sequences that I worked on were in there, but then there's a lot of stuff that was changed, mostly the ending. Like, because the, the, I can tell you the sequences I did work on. I worked on the Themyscira stuff, like when uh, Steppenwolf comes to Themyscira, mm -hmm. and then I did the ending. Uh, I came in and we, I came in and I punched up the ending to kind of most of the ending, not the Batmobile stuff. That was stuff was really worked out before I came there. But I did from the time that they arrived into the kind of nuclear reactor 
all the way to the end of the the fight. So I did all of I did a lot of that. Um, a lot of that had already been kind of pre vised out, so they had kind of a kind of a blocking in. But that's why Zach wanted me to come in and take a look at it and, and kind of do my pass and do and. Uh, and so, like, there's, I think there's that shot you guys see that it's not in the film, but I think it's Wonder Woman standing on the bridge with Aquaman and Cyborg. Like, that's one of the first scenes that I had done. So that's why I was like, where's that? Or, you know, there's, there's a, uh, a couple of stuff that, um, uh, that when I watched the film, I was like, well, what happened to that? Because, uh, you know, I was looking forward to seeing it because I had done some, like, crazy stuff you know uh i was trying to top myself what i had done with superman when superman comes back i was i had done some really crazy stuff you know like superman man unhinged kind of thing like you know uh i was really riffing off of there's an episode of superman uh, adventures where he fights dark side and and he he uh uh he tells dark side that i i have to hold myself back you know, when I fight people, but I'm not going to hold myself back with you. And he just kind of works dark side. So I was kind of riffing off what Bruce did when I, when I had Superman fight Steppenwolf, you know, I was just like, let me just, what is, what does this Superman look like where he comes back and he's like even more powerful and even more strong, like, and even more fast. Like, what does that look like? Um, so that's why, like, when I saw the film, I was like, okay. And like the Russian family that was never there. Um, <laughs> that that whole narrative i was uh i was that that was yeah i was surprised most by, by that the other thing that i was most kind of surprised and kind of disappointed in was was the fact that the origin story of the cyborg kind of disappeared um because again when i when i was working on it and also you know uh when i uh when i was watching the film you know there were a lot of parallels to my justice league war film yeah. You know, if you if you watch Just League War and watch Just League, it's very there's a lot of parallels in there. You know, it's the parademons coming in and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, remember Jeff Johns was was involved a lot. So, you know, I, I already knew, oh, Jeff Johns about is involved with Justice League. Of course he's gonna try to of course the the stuff that they had done with you know, he had done with Jim Lee on the Justice League War comic, which I then kind of did a version in, in my version of it. Which I also gave a copy of the of the of it to Zach while we were on Batman v Superman. Uh, yeah. I could see that there's some influences in it, so I thought, "Oh, this is great! I can't wait!" You know, this is great. There's going to be an origin, uh, cyborg origin. This would be, you know, leads into it. But then that all disappeared. You know, I mean, there's like I said, like you see it online. There's that, you know, there's the uh, the, uh, the sequence where the, the football sequence. And if you watch my movie, there's a football sequence. Yeah. You know, and again, you can if you can kind of if you if if. I think if, if if the Center Cut ever comes out, um, if you watch that and watch what I did, there's a lot of parallels to there. And again, I, I attribute to the fact that Jeff Johns was involved with it because who wouldn't want to be like, hey, I wrote this Justice League. Can I get some of these scenes in here? You know, in fact, the opening with Batman and the Parademon that wasn't there. I mean, that's a new scene that 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 I think Joss had done. But that's kind of the opening scene for my Justice League War movie. You know, in, in some respects, when you look at it, so um, you know, actually, one thing maybe you can clear up. Actually, now that I think about it, uh, a lot of like the fan tension has been centered, or some of the vitriol even has been centered on Jeff Johns, uh, someone who we've mentioned at least three times in the podcast. Uh, obviously, none of us can discredit his amazing legacy on the comic uh -huh. side of things, but some people. When they're looking for a finger to point, looking to point at someone for Justice League, a lot of fingers go at him. Is this something you can clear up, like for the fans uh, on either side? Like, I'm not gonna uh, force you in either direction, but is this anything you can say, like on Jeff Johns and his role with Justice League? Well, I mean, my my interaction with Jeff Johns on on Justice League uh, was very narrow in the sense that. Um, I mean, the great thing is I got to hang out with him a lot and have dinner because we stayed at the same hotel. And in fact, you know, his driver used to pick me up and take me to set and stuff. So I got to spend a lot of time with him. And, we, you know, we, we talked all things comic books and whatnot. So, you know, everything that my interaction with him was 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 fine. You know, but then again, you know, he was, you know, he's, he's executive. He's my boss at the time. But but um, so, you know professionally like you know it's because of him that i got to work on the titans tv series and stuff and uh, and so my relationship with him has always just been that you know like if if he needs me I, if i'm available I'll, I'll help him out uh for the justice league thing i don't know what happened behind the scenes so i can't really comment exactly what happened because i i, I didn't see anything because but then again i was only there for two months of the production um and and a lot of the stuff that maybe happened was you know after the the movie has had been done 
had been finished, you know, it was, it was around, I think after the new year and around the time that Zach eventually stepped back. So I don't know what happened. I mean, I, someday I'll ask Zach about it, but I don't really, I don't, I'm not going to pressure him. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? yeah. So uh, for the fans expecting me to kind of, you know, either add fire or to extinguish it, I can't really do either because again, I, my relationship with Jeff has always been pretty good, but I wasn't there around those decisions that, uh, that ultimately made Justice League into what it was, you know, because uh, like I said, I'm just a cog in the wheel. I'm just, my, my credit, I don't think I even, I'm even credited on Justice League, but usually my credit is after like craft services and everybody's assistant and the hairdresser. So in the grand scheme of things, at least in terms of where I fit, I'm a small cog, except my contribution to the films are usually very big, which is why, again, I work with the directors closely. But like I said, I, I there's really no way I, I can't really comment one way or the other about about Jeff, other than the fact that you know he's 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 given me a bunch of opportunities to work on projects, and he's always been uh, cordial to me and on a professional level, and I enjoy working with him. But that's as far as I can really say about this subject. Yeah, I mean it's it's hard to tell. Like uh, again, like we're fans of Jeff Johns as 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 from our end, like as fans of seeing a creator. I mean, for what it's worth, he did like a tweet of mine. When I said uh-huh. that, I said it before Just Like came uh-huh. out around July. So I think it's right when reshoots are about to start, I guess. I said, oh, don't worry, guys. That, uh, Just Like will still be Zack Snyder's film. I said it kind of like in this kind of blind way of like, oh, of course it'll be his film. The reshoots are minor. You know, like that's what we were being spoon fed by WB at the yes. time. So I said, uh-huh. oh, it's just minor reshoots. Don't worry, it's Zack's film. And Jeff Johns then liked my tweet, which led to people saying, oh, this must be a confirmation of some kind. In the end, like when you see the final product, it really doesn't feel like a Zack Snyder film. It feels more like, like too many chefs in in the kitchen kind of a thing, and uh, you just got like a smorgasbord of a uh, Just League film, which I guess it is what it is. But um, yeah, that's just uh, that's one thing. But it's all good if you can't clear it up or whatever the case might be. At least from hey, your I'm sure, interaction, I'm sure you're gonna see articles tomorrow saying you know Jerry Lever condemns Jeff Johns or something like that. Because, <laughs> again, people will read into it however they want it. Yeah, and, yeah, and, like, yeah. A lot, a lot of people are, like, in, you know, getting on my case, like, why, why are you fueling stuff? And I'm like, what am I fueling? I'm just saying how it was. You know, like, yeah. like that one guy mentioning about, you know, Ben Affleck didn't have a script, and I'm like, are you kidding me? That was, like, the best script that I've read. But <laughs> who am I? I'm just a guy who worked yeah, on Batman we're... films, and, you know, but if you're going to call that out, don't, you know, if I'm going to call you out on it, don't, don't say that, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, you got to be prepared. You got to be prepared for somebody to re- respond to that. You yeah, know? that's my thing. It's like everything that I've mentioned is all the truth for the most part. I and mean, because of the fact that, like, I was there, uh, I'm seeing that firsthand. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, make up stuff uh, just to fit somebody's narrative. I'm going to say, like, this is how it is. You know, like I said, with the Jeff Sean things, I, I don't know what happened, you know, uh, because I wasn't there. But with the stuff with when I was working with Zach personally and working on, you know, BVS and Man of Steel and on Justice League, I can say, yeah, this is what we did. You know, and I was working with Ben Affleck. I'd be like, this is what he planned. He planned something really cool. I can't tell you what was in the script, but Ben knew his stuff. Like, he was... Like working with him was another highlight of my career. It was short, and I wish I, I wish he really made his film. But again, you know, uh, ultimately making these films is is a very tiring and just emotionally taxing kind of thing. And I guess maybe at that time in his life, he's just like, I need to kind of work on myself or have some time. Because again, he was flying back and forth all the time. And, you know, it's it's a tough life. So I understood that. And I, I think like I mentioned when the last time I talked to Ben, I was like, hey, if you ever need me, just let me know. And same thing with Patty and all the other directors I've worked with. It's, you know, I do the best job that I can. You know, um, the, you know, I, I'm not I'm not playing favorites with anybody. I mean, I've worked with directors that I, that I don't like, but, you know, work is work. I'll do the best job that I can because they hire me for a job, you know, and nothing's personal. Um, but I hope that I get hired again. But at the same time, I have a career of my own. Like, people just think that, like, oh, you're just saying this because you work for Warner Brothers. I'm like, and I've been saying the last couple of years, like, I don't work for Warner Brothers anymore. You know, I have, no, I have nothing to gain. You know, I have a very promising career of my own in animation and live action that I'm trying to get into and stuff. So, um I really have no reason to lie. And exactly. I think plus, people, yeah. Some people discredit you, I think, in the sense that, you know, we made a joke in the beginning that, oh, yeah, the blue tick, the check mark is in there. Like, people are so superficial on social media that they don't actually yeah. take the time to look into uh, your repertoire. And uh, you have a resume that 
can go par, par, par for par for with anybody. So the fact people don't look yeah. at it like, oh, it's just this guy with the Batman uh, profile picture. Yeah. So they don't treat you like uh, the way I think they should be treating someone who is a director and who has uh, two decades plus worth of experience uh, in the yeah, industry. I love, it when they, I love it when they say, artist says this, you know, and then it's, as if like discrediting just the fact that I'm an artist, like I don't really know what I'm talking about. And they don't even, there's no mention of the fact that yeah, I'm also executive producer, I'm director, I've done a bunch, I've done a lot of stuff other than just storyboarding on these films, but they just say, artist says this, and then everybody just kind of discounts it. And I'm just like, well, I was there. Like, like you know, like, that, let's just that Wall Street Journal thing. Like, uh, they, yeah, yeah. They, they just say, like, you know, Warner Brothers says this. And I'm like, well, who did you call? Because honestly, any one of us can call Warner Brothers Hotline and be like, is there a Snyder Cut? And the person will be like, no, okay. And you can <laughs> go write that. You know, Warner Brothers says there's no Snyder Cut. So yeah, of course they're gonna say no. Or whoever you call, who did you call? Who did you talk to? Did you? But here I am, and when I did my interview, I was like, you can use my name. I'm not hiding. I'm just not anonymous. I'm saying this is what the, this is. This is what I know about the Snyder Cut, and what I know about the Snyder Cut movement. This is what this is all about. And you can quote me on that. But then you will read the article, and it doesn't fit their narrative. They want to. They want to. They want to show. You know. Uh, DC or Snyder fans as being these kind of religious zealots who are crazy. And, and like I said, my thing coming in as somebody who's a professional is very level headed and it didn't fit their narrative. So they had to, they dropped it. You know? And I'm like, okay, well fine. You know what? I'm never doing an interview for, for you ever again. You know? And uh, this is the one time that I thought, you know what? I'll give it a, I'll give a journalist a shot. Cause the thing is I even Googled that guy just to see, okay, is this guy legit? You know, cause originally I wasn't going to answer his email, and I, and I saw the whole thing about Gamergate and all this kind of stuff that is in his past. And I was like, well, I don't know if I should do this. But then I saw that Fiona and some of the other Snyder Cut people uh, were like, well, yeah, I'm going to do the interview. So I thought, well, you know what? If they're going to do it, you know, I'm going to give this guy a shot. You know, because based upon what I read on him when I Googled him, it didn't look favorable. And, and for me, I always think the best of people. I never, I never expect people to backstab me or do something bad. So I always am very trusting in that way. And uh, and so I, that's why again I did my interview and yeah that whole yeah, article he was respond, uh, yeah and he responded like well you know we didn't really we didn't really need to use it and this and I was like okay well that's fine but you know what don't ask me f- about this and but not but not not write an article that says both sides I was like what is journalism journalism yeah. is supposed to be back and forth if you just want to put it an opinion piece then when you interview me say I'm writing an opinion piece but if you're trying to do it, if you if you're the one who came to me and you wanted to show both sides of it. But then don't write about that. Then, I mean, who's the, in the wrong there? Because I'm coming with you in good faith. I w- I basically wasted an hour and a half of two hours of my time that I could have been doing other stuff, you know. But yet, I here I am entertaining this guy's fancy, and he never want he never planned on using it. Yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a, definitely a lack of journalistic integrity and on the. Yeah, his you part. know, the thing is, is that like I get it. Like you know, we all have jobs and we have stuff to do. But you know what, like. If you're gonna do it, be professional about it, you know. And 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 like I said, if you're a journalist, present both ways because that's how it is. That's you gotta exactly, write an article. Exactly, yeah, you, yeah. You, you present both sides, and then let the audience decide. But if you're already gonna, you know, have a narrative, then that's an opinion yeah, piece, and you should automatically fit. tell the people you're interviewing that I'm writing an opinion piece. Yeah, they just want to fit what they're trying to say, right? Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I, it's clickbait, you know. <laughs> definitely, yeah. Definitely. You know, I know you touched on this a little bit, but let's just talk about it a little uh-huh, further. Um. So let's talk about the movement around the Snyder Cut. And obviously that's a big part of why it's been such a prevalent topic on social media. You know, obviously no movement is perfect. And the Snyder Cut movement has had its bumps in the road. But for the most part, you know, when they're focused, it it really is something Well, yeah, I guess I know what you're going at. So it's funny. I'm glad you brought it back because I didn't get to finish my point about how social media and this vocal few changed the way that, uh, you know, this course of the DCU ended up being, and also, you know, even the Marvel for that point, uh, for that matter. The thing is what I'm telling fans now, even fans who don't like me or don't like, you know, Zach's movies or the DC stuff is that um, it's going to be the fans who are going to try to bring it back. You know, like uh, the fans have to show that they're in support of, of what these directors are trying to go for, you know, and, 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 and to try to keep the integrity of the artists whether you like it or not, but again, that's that's how you get, you know, that's how you you get stories that are outside the box, like The Dark Knight Returns or 
of Flashpoint Paradox. Because if you think about it, before that, Barry Allen was dead, you know, and and uh, and if it wasn't for Flashpoint Paradox, and then um, you know what Jeff Johns did with reviving the character. Now look, we've got CW Flash. Flash is a you know very healthy character. And that's the thing is, fandom has to be more supportive of each other and of these characters than than try to be like at each other's throats because it's just going to water down all of the properties and we're just going to get you know uh stories that that are either kidified or watered down or have no kind of teeth to it uh and i don't and it's okay to have you know things that are meant for you know uh, popcorn flicks but you also for me i want to see stuff that's a little bit more uh deeper than that you yeah, know def- but that's definitely. my taste you know I was an, i'm an older guy now so i'm looking for different things in films but that's okay but when you, you start to tell people that this is the only kind of films that can be made then guess what uh everything's gonna suffer you know all the films They're not only just the marvel films and dc films you're gonna see that in the star wars films you're gonna see in the harry potter films you're gonna see it everywhere and and that's not what filmmaking's that's not what storytelling is about you know and and the thing is, is, the only way it can get back is if we support uh, what these filmmakers are trying to do. And that's really what the Snyder Cut movie is trying to do, is to keep the artistic integrity and to leave um, uh, studio kind of uh, hands out of it. I mean, mind you, there are times when studio involvement does help. But remember, a lot of these studio executives are, are knee-jerk reaction to what you, the fans, are writing on social media, what you're posting and whatnot. And... And that's why when people say like, oh, you should just move on, Snyder Cut people, whatever. I was like, well, you guys didn't move on about the, you know, colorless Superman or pe- all those people who died on, <laughs> on Metropolis on Man of Steel. I mean, like, I was seeing articles of that, that like years later. It's like, okay, I get it. You didn't like the movie. Do you, you know what I mean? So I get it. That was their position and they kept going running with it. So you know what? You know, what worked for them can work for us or people yeah. who supported what Zach was trying to do. And I would say, like, let them do it. You know, like, what, what is it to you if these people are just doing hashtag Snyder Cut or uh, release the Snyder Cut? What is it to you, really? Is, is it is it coming up on your feed that much that you're so irritated that you have to come in and, like, berate these people for loving what they love? You know, and, and that's my thing. I mean, all my Twitter it, posts is just, like, yeah, love just, what you love and support the fans. You know, I mean, that's, that, that's what it yeah. is. And we're all fans. I mean, we're all love these characters in a certain way and we all have different versions of these characters and you have to celebrate that as opposed to be like my version is the only version that that should exist and once you start doing that then then you start being like that kind of like you're policing what people should like and not like and that or that's not cool because art is you know is for everyone and you either like or you don't like it and that's okay you just move on to the next thing if you don't like it but if you love it you stick with it and that's what these that's what the Snyder Cut movie at least the way I see it um, and of course, you know, there, of course, there's going to be bad apples every now and then. I mean, I, I was I was looking at some threads where people were like, you know, why doesn't uh, you know, you know, why is the, they're saying like, why why am I adding fuel to the flames and all this stuff? And I'm like, who am I to tell people what to do and what not to do? I mean, if anything that I do, I try to shine light onto the situation and 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 bring my perspective on it. But again, if you're going to hate the film that I worked on, I'll just be like, okay, that that's cool. Do you really need to write yeah. twenty posts about it? You know, why are you why are you adding me about you hating stuff? I was like, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't go to your work and and start telling your boss like, yeah, this guy sucks and I hate the way he, you know, does his reports. Like, what yeah, is it to you? just to, just to kind of jump off your earlier point, um, Justice League and speaking for the for the four of us. I mean, when after I think after Batman v Superman came out, I think that night. Uh, I think it was a Thursday. We talked about it literally all night. That's how much we loved it. And wow. then, as soon as you know, we uh, we knew that Justice was the next big thing. Um, for a year straight, and I'm kidding it. Like I kid you not. For a year straight, all we talked about was just and how yeah. it's gonna be, <laughs> whatever. And, and all these reports were coming out. And the biggest nightmare we had was was the studio taking the film and basically messing with it to the point where it's not it's not as dense or it's not as heavy mm-hmm. as maybe Batman v Superman or Man of Steel. Um, and then on November 17th, you know, we kind of, uh, like, I, I remember how disappointed all of us were when we left the theater. I mean, we all loved, there's parts where we knew it was, you know, we knew it was Zach's vision and we were like, wow, this is, this is good. And then there was other parts where you knew that, that, that something yeah, they had, had changed it. Uh-huh. Yeah. That they had changed and that basically messed with the original vision. Um, mm-hmm. And that disappointment 
I think a lot of fans, even, I mean, and it had ripple effects, right? Like, especially with ben, when it comes to Ben Affleck, you see that yeah. when you change Justice League that much, you know, how is Ben Affleck supposed to feel? And then on top of that, he has a script all, like ready, you know, um, mm-hmm. and you're not the, what's amazing is you weren't the only one that actually came out and, and, and said that he had a script. I think, um, what's the, the actor that plays Deathstroke? He also, oh yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. He also came out and, and kind of, uh, I think he liked some tweets or something. And he basically yeah. said that, yeah, there was, there was something in plan. And you see that the ripple effects are so crazy from just see that it's, 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 it, it went onward. So at, like someone like Ben Affleck going through, uh, you know, going through that, you know, having, having, and mm-hmm. even his scenes, you can tell the scenes that were reshot because he got out of shape after, I mean, he's still, oh, yeah. still Ben Affleck, but he got out of shape because uh, just like, as a, like anyone would, you know, he was Batman. He was in Batman shape for a particular time. So you can tell the scenes that were changed. You can literally any anyone that mm-hmm. you could just tell by his belly that the scenes have been completely they're different. So oh, yeah. the ripple effects are so crazy that you have uh, Ben now that uh, I, I don't even think I think anyone that goes to a situation like that. I mean, why would you want to continue? And although exactly, we all want yeah. him back, we all would love to see him back. Um, you know, uh, so what's your kind of? I, I'm wait, sure you want to love to see him back as well. Yeah, Umar, Umar, Umar. So what do you think about that? Umar, yeah. About about Ben? Well, I mean, the thing is, is that you know, the time I got to spend with Ben, like I mentioned, was one of the highlights of my career because you know, we talked, of course, all things Batman, what he wanted to do, and what he loved about Batman the Animated Series and stuff like that, and it was all really cool. But then I got to talk shop with him after that. Like we finished that, and then we, I still had like you know, twenty minutes or thirty minutes with him, so I got to talk shop about director to director. I was just like, hey, so how do you do it when you're directing and you're in front of the camera and stuff like that, and. And here's the thing, though, is that, like, man, he impressed me with how much he, he knew about film, how much he loved film, about film craft and everything. And my respect for him grew exponentially. I mean, I liked him before, but this, I realized that he wasn't just an actor who who just happened to get into directing. Like, he was always a director. Uh, but the acting part is what gave him leverage in Hollywood, you know. And, uh, and like I said, like... When I worked with him, the when I worked with him, it was one of the, the high points in my career. And so when I had heard that he eventually stepped away from the directing job, I was really, really sad because again, that script to me, you know, uh, was fantastic. I mean, I, I, I get the fact that there needed to be um, massaged and stuff like that, but I, I, I'm looking at for me as a director, I look at the structure, I look at the bones. The dialogue can be changed at any time, but I'm looking at how one scene leads to another and how character arcs kind of are fulfilled and and you know. A, B, C story kind of stuff. And I liked what I read. I, and in fact, you know, I was telling Jeff Johns because I think at the time I, remember, I was working on an early draft that was like in the summer of, of 2017. Uh, I think after that, there were a couple other drafts that maybe never really saw the light of day. But the draft that I had read, which was one of the earlier ones that Jeff Johns and, and, and Ben had written together. I don't know if Chris Terrio had already taken a pass on it yet. But I was really excited. I was already, I read it and I was ecstatic. And I was telling, I was telling this over dinner with Jeff Johns, um, like how, what a really cool take that they were trying to go with. Like how they were taking the, the Batman uh, mythos or the canon and weaving that into what was going to eventually be Ben's film, you know, within this universe that started with Man of Steel. And I, and for me, I mean, that was exciting stuff. And like I said, I work on a lot of Batman stuff. So, there's not many Batman stuff that will get me that excited, but for this, I was uh, I was jazzed about it, you know, and 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 working with Ben and all the things he wanted to do was you know was all great. But it's again, it's it's a psychological game. I mean, if you if every day you turn on the TV and you're being told that you suck, you're eventually going to believe it, you know. And and I think that's that, that's the that is the the power of social media, you know. You 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 people think that oh, I'm just you know, presenting my opinion and this and that, which is great and all, but you know what? Uh, it's going to affect, it's, it, it affected the studio execs, it, exe- it affected the actors, it affect, It has this ripple effect. When you start spreading negativity, then eventually the negativity is going to go somewhere. People like to think that doesn't go anywhere, but it does. Because even when I read my reviews, like I'll look at my reviews on Amazon or whatever, 
and I'll always see like, oh, I loved it and stuff. I skim through that until I get to the one star and I'll read it. And sometimes, and before I used to take it personally. And then I, and then at some point I just let it go. I'm like, you know what? Okay. This person, maybe they just were having a bad day. I just, just wasn't their thing. It's cool. Everybody has different Change opinions. Change topics. Um, they're talking about the Batman script. Is there anything you can speak on that in terms of like content or like what it's going to be about? No. Unfortunately, I can't even okay. say what's in it, other than what the audience already knows, which was Deathstroke was in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, So I can't, yeah, that's part of my NDA. I can't right, really that, say fair. much about that, unless, or else I'm going to get sued. <laughs> I guess a follow-up question for you, what are your thoughts on Matt Reeves taking over uh, the reins of that film? Uh, are, you, are you excited for uh, it? Well, uh, again, he, Matt Reeves is going to be doing his version of it, because it's not the script that, at least they're not doing do what I read, but I was ecstatic. I love Matt Reeves' stuff. I love all the Planet of the Apes stuff. He's a fantastic director. I hope that um, once they have a script that's ready, he gives me a call, but, you know, I mean, uh, you, for me, I'm like, I always want to work on everything, and everything yeah. cool, and I love Do you think Ben would do so, but, do you think But ben I'm excited to, to see what he ends up doing do you think that ben will uh work with them on this film or what do you have any insight knowledge on uh, that aspect of it uh i have no clue i remember the last my last interaction with warner brothers was probably 2017 like december you know that was when i was doing reshoots for patty on wonder woman and then the on, and just a little bit on just things so that was the last time i was like an insider and in, into warner brothers because right after that they stopped production on all of the other films that they were doing which i was going to be planned on working on um because they want because again they want because of all the because i think because suicide squad didn't do so well the execs were like well we don't want to go through we don't want to start greenlighting new stuff let's just see how one woman does and justice league so yeah that's and i was out of a job at that point so i was like okay i guess you gotta go look for work <laughs> <laughs> and and things like and things like aquaman you didn't do any work on with that like that was the end of your thing no i mean the thing is that when uh, when james wan was in production like pre-production for that they were um i was working with ben well i was doing multiple things i was working with rick uh from Uyiba on flash and i was supposed to go t- to london like in october like i you remember i, I was in I was in London for Justice League from August to September. And then when I came back, I was going to be here just for a few weeks in LA. And then I was going to fly out again to, um, to, to London because I was going to work on flash. Um, wait, am I, is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's when Rick stepped back and he didn't. And so they basically stopped production on that. And that was when, uh, um, I was supposed to start, getting back with Ben, but that was when they were changing the script. They were trying, there were some kind of things that they were going to change. So I was on hold uh, to work on the Batman and that's when uh, the Wonder Woman reshoots came about. So then Patty was like, Oh, you know, we have a first cut. Can you take a look at it? And, yeah. you know, we have some notes we need to plan out for reshoots. So then I, uh, for the next two and a half months, I was working with Patty um, on reshoots for Wonder Woman. And then when I finished that, I was ready to jump back onto Batman with Ben. And that was when I heard the news that Ben, I think at the time that's when he went to rehab or something like that, or, yeah. or, or he, I think that was also like him going to rehab and stepping away from the director's chair was the kind of like one, two punch. Yeah. And so, um, uh, when I had asked, can I get onto James Wan, James Wan's um, Aquaman? They were already about to go to Australia, um, so, so they had and, he, and most of their things are already done. So then there was no place for me. So that was when I was like, okay, I, I guess I gotta go look for work. Yeah, and it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting when you look back. I look back and see how much uh, the course changed. Like there was a certain like uh, projection for the DC extended universe, and now it's a uh, far cry from that. And it's very different. But even when it's different, like, what are your reactions? Like, and now, like, you're looking at it as a fan. And what are your reactions on that? And, like, when you see things like, oh, Henry Cavill might be gone as Superman. Or, no, he's staying as Superman. Like, how do you process that knowing that you're such a big part of, you know, the early stages of it? Um, I mean, uh, for me, I feel like, you know, like, Henry could have done another one or two films as Superman. I would have loved to have seen that. I mean, the same thing with, you know, um with gal on on the wonder woman films i mean i'd love to see another you know one or two films uh, past the what the 84 wonder woman one um but here's here's the thing that i think a lot of fans don't understand is that making these films is about a two and a half year commitment just to make one you know so uh 
So if you were to do three films, let's say you do Iron Man 1, 2, and 3, for example, that's like 10 years of your life already. You know, That's 10 years of you not being able to take any other jobs. You have to always be in sh- shape you know you have to always look the, the same way and it's it's a tough job being an actor especially for these kind of superhero films and so um the the shelf life for the actors playing these roles is very finite which is why again I, when zach originally told me his idea of what he wanted to do with the with when the movies were just fat five films at the, at the time you know five films with one spin-off um you know, he already knew that after the five films, we're just gonna, they're just going to reboot it again. Because again, after five films, you're looking at about almost 10 to 12 years if you do you know, a two-year cycle for every film. Yeah, it's about 10 to 12 years, um, depending. The actors are going to be in their 40s at that point. You, know? uh, you can't do another you know, five films after that. So it's best to just tell your story and you know, how many you know, the five episodes or what, I mean, five uh, movies or whatever Zach had planned. And then, of course, you're going to reboot it and there's going to be a younger cast, different take. I mean, that's always the case. I and mean, that's why the whole Mad Reeves thing and the, the idea, like which kind of, which version of, ba- of, not, of Batman they're going to use. Well, you know, um, it's, it's, it's going to change depending on what the script is, what the script is asking for. Is it an older, is it an older Batman? Like, is it a, is it a younger Batman? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it all depends, but the actors are going to keep aging as opposed to the animated stuff. My animated stuff, as long as Kevin Conroy sounds fairly the same, we're going to keep making Batmans, you know, he's going to be doing Batman till you know, he can't talk anymore yeah. because again, he, he's, his voice is all is is what he's lending to the character but the animators and the directors or whatever are making him kind of live on and act you know beyond that um and 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 that's why something like 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 what he does that character can keep going and we can keep doing stuff whereas like christian bale after three films is like i'm done with that man you know because again it's it's a lot of work it's physically emotionally mentally um so with the, the where dc is going to go after this um, I don't know. I mean, it, it makes sense. I can just see it. I mean, uh, they probably end up just rebooting, which is what they're doing with you know all of these newer films. I mean, the Joaquin Phoenix one. I saw the the test stuff. That looks interesting. I'll, I'll check that out too. Uh, yeah. I think what's going to happen is they're going to try all these different versions of the DC characters, and whichever one the audience really kind of connects to, that might be the new DC universe. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising. I mean, again, it's, yeah, I feel like that's what they're going to do. Also, they just kind of see what sticks. They're kind of throwing the yeah. kitchen sink right now and just seeing, okay. Let's yeah. try everything and whatever yeah, happens. The only, happens. Uh-huh, I'm sorry, but the only uh, before I forget, the only bad thing with that is the fact that I still want to see more Gal films. I still want to see Jason Momoa as Aquaman films. So if they do decide to go a different route, how do you fit those other actors and actresses? Because I I still want to see more of them, at least for a couple more films. But that's where that's where you have brand recognition and and a fan base who like those characters. But yet you're trying to reboot it. Uh, maybe prematurely because you still have a fan base who still likes that. You yeah, know, like when Zach originally started, and that's where I think it's going to be. It's, it's going to be interesting, you know. And I think you're going to see the same thing happen when when Disney starts to transition away from Avengers and into X Men. You know what I mean? Like you, the, the the audience for the most part has grown up with Iron Man and and all of the Avengers that we know and love. But of course, again, these actors are getting older. They can't keep doing these these films. And Disney just acquired X Men, so they can't be making Avengers movies and X Men movies and Star Wars movies. They're gonna have to eventually shift the Marvel storyline to integrate into the X Men universe and eventually carry that X Men universe also into the Fantastic Four universe, you know, in some way. Uh, and you're gonna see it shift. And then, you know, for me, I'm still gonna be missing the fact that, like, man, you know, what? I really, I, I really wish. That I get to see a story with Ben Grimm and and Thor, but not Thor, the Odin's son Thor, where he's the ruler of Asgard. I still like Thor as just being, you know, the, the classic Thor that I, I love. I want I want to see that story, but of course, in the way the continuity is is now. I'm sorry if I'm spoiling people, but um, that's not going to happen. And yeah. That to me is the sad part, you know, because I love I you know I, I always love it when Spider Man teams up with Captain America, you know, in the comics, you know, and. And the fact that, you know, it, whether or not uh, they continue the character on past Infinity War, uh, the, this thing, I don't think he's going to continue into the X-Men series, but I always wanted to see, one of my favorite comics was a, was a Jim Lee, it was a, a Black Widow, Captain America, Wolverine 
uh, story that when Jim Lee was doing Kenny X Men, uh, and I would love to see that as a movie. But by then, again, it's the actors are going to be too old, or they've already transitioned to the more, you know, uh, X Men kind of storylines with whether it's Dark Phoenix or you know uh, Apocalypse or you know with anything with X Men, they're eventually going to build up to Apocalypse and they'll yeah. have Mutant Mask or House of M, that kind of stuff. Uh, but then with the Fantastic Four, you know, there's going to be Doctor Doom and all that stuff. But I want to see Doctor Doom go toe to toe with the Hulk. What's that? What does that look like? Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Um, well, think, if they some, start to go away from the Avengers, that might not happen. And that's yeah. a sad thing about it. You know, I think some people the continuity that they're, that they're setting up. I think that some people, I think that's when you're comparing like DC and Marvel, I think some people feel like, oh, we never got that out of DC because, again, like studio changes. Like, you know, like, even the most hardcore DC fans, they wanted to see these characters go through four, five, six films. Like we've seen Iron Man with Robert Downey Jr. in about like what? eight Marvel films now like he's in six yeah. seven yeah but eight eight Marvel the ninth one is coming up next year so that's nine times you saw the same exactly. actor in the same costume going through such a big storyline and now you're getting already prematurely cut with two films with Superman two and a half I guess if you count Justice League then you got one and a half film with Batman right and then obviously Wonder Woman caught fire so we're gonna get two feature films with Wonder Woman, hopefully more. But I think they did catch uh, fire in a bottle with Gal Gadot and uh, Patty Jenkins. So I can see Patty making a trilogy uh, if eighty four goes well. And then if James Wan hits the gold mine with Aquaman, then I can see them building more films with um, Jason. But I think it's so unfortunate because Zach built something really strong with Superman, and Superman and Batman are kind of like well, they're the world's finest. You know, they're the most they're exactly. the pantheon of what DC is. And those are the two characters where the media attention is most toxic and most of the discourse is happening. So it's like if your Superman and your Batman aren't aligned right, then the whole universe doesn't seem like it's aligned right, you know? And now wow. that both actors are kind of either being pushed out of, uh, of their uh, respective costumes or don't feel like doing it anymore – it's just more pause for concern, you know? So I think that's some of the thing that the fan base and everybody's kind of like on edge with. And obviously we all said, I think all five of us would love to see Henry back as Superman for the next film, whenever eventually they make it. And then I'm not sure if Ben will, will do the Matt Reeves script, but if he does, I'm all for it. But so that's like one of those things, you know, it's like, it's interesting to look at it in a vacuum. They got to get for sure. Like that's, I think that's like a, it, it wouldn't make sense to recast. You can't recast Superman. You just can't. Like, it doesn't make sense. To me, at least, it doesn't. This early, yeah. I feel like well, at least one more, then you can consider it. But I feel like I you need one ben, more. I think, like, you're, even if you do re recast, it's going to take time for people to just kind of accept. Especially if you keep the universe going, which is, uh -huh. which is the plan. Well, here's the thing, though, is that, like, they haven't said one way or the other. And like I mentioned before, social media is a powerful thing. Like, you guys have it in your hands. If you keep, you know, you keep the Snyder Cut, release the Snyder Cut thing alive, the hashtag, and, and keep talking about it as well as, you know, talk about, you know, how much you loved Henry as Superman and this and that. I mean, it's going to start building. I mean, people keep writing articles, positive articles about it. It's going to start building something because like i said it worked for all the negativity it could still work for for the fans now you know yeah and i think there is a best of both worlds i mean there is uh where you can be supportive and excited for the dceu films to come like we're all excited for aquaman we want to see uh the new joker filming that's outside the universe we can't wait for whatever a genius like matt reeves will pull out of the hat but we can also still want to see the snyder cut of justice i think people uh, and this is uh, kind of like my observation. It's like people are too stuck on one end of the fandom. Like the real, some parts of the release of Snyder Cut movement are just purely based on that. And then they'll some like a very 1%, 2% will be like, oh, don't watch Aquaman. Yeah, don't watch these new the films, film. right? And I feel like that's wrong as well. And then you have the other side saying, oh, just get over the Snyder Cut. And that's wrong as well. I think there's a middle ground where you can be excited for the future, but also campaign for the kind of stories exactly. you want to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the thing is, is that uh, Henry still isn't like he. They haven't really said exactly if he's out or not. I mean, there's uh, 
you know, stranger things have happened. So there's no reason why, like there's shows of like Futurama came back because the fans asked for it, you know, and uh, there's a lot of things that happened that the fans have a lot of power, uh, both negative and positive. And it's, it's like I said, it's, if, if enough, if, he, if the movement keeps moving and enough kind of positive kind of stuff comes about and people, you know, reading articles and stuff that, that keeps it in the, in the public conversation, there's no only reason why it can't, it can't happen, you know? Yeah, and uh, I guess I guess that we'll we'll that kind of goes goes through everything that we wanted to talk about. But there is still one question I think that is lingering on everybody's mind, and that's what did uh-huh. you have for breakfast, Jay? I had steak and eggs. That's steak my favorite. Eggs. I love steak and eggs and an English muffin. That's, oh, that's nice, my breakfast. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jay, man. I know we. I know, so I, do you have any like uh, future projects you're working on? I think you, you want to share with us like what's in the future for Jay Oliva, you know, that um, we can be excited for. There's so uh, many fans of yours. I've got, yeah, I've got, I've got some big things on the horizon, but nothing I can, I can announce without lawyers getting on my, on my, uh, on my case. But um, hopefully, I mean, send good, good, positive thoughts my way because uh, there's some really big things on the horizon that I'm, uh, that I'm, that I'm slowly, but it might happen really, really quickly, uh, trying to make happen. And if that happens, it'll be, it'll, it'll be something big. Like you guys are going to be like, wow, this is, this is like game changer. So, um, that's all I can say. It's very vague. I know, but uh, as soon as it's, it's, as soon as it's a reality, uh, I just don't want to jinx it, but I'm hoping that it'll be something uh, what I expect it to be, which will be really big, and you guys will be the first to know about it. Oh, epic! <laughs> and you know, if you end up finding yourself uh, in New York City, uh, we're always here, myself and Zion, and we can and catch o- up. Omer and Smear are flying down, and they actually fly. Omer and Smear are flying down for Comic Con, so if you're going to be in the area, uh, we yeah, can I def- usually go to, I usually go to Comic Con every year. So if you're at, in San Diego, you know, let's meet up, and oh, go San- hang yeah, out, yeah. And get some drinks, and. And and uh, and and talk all things uh, geek and nerd pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and same thing free. If you're ever in New York City, feel free. Just give me a text, or I'll give you a text if I find out you're here, and we'll set oh, something yeah, up. Man. All right, sounds yeah. good. I mean, uh, hopefully very soon. I hope. I mean, uh, yeah, I hope right. it'll be very all soon. Right. I'm just gonna do a wrap up, Jay, and then we can quickly okay. just talk then personally. So when I say okay. sounds good, when you say like, oh yeah, see you later, whatever, you don't have to leave the thing. Just you can stay. Yeah. Yes. All right. So. Uh, just want to thank you one more time, Jay, from all of us, from myself, from Zayan, from Umar and Samir. You know, uh, it's been such an honor to have you on our podcast. I mean, like you, like we told you in the beginning, the stuff that you've been working since the beginning of your career is the reason why we've even been fans of this medium. So, yeah. like, we are the generation that's been impacted by your work in that sense. So, uh, we're very big fans of you, and we want to thank you again for uh, being on our podcast. Well, I'm I'm honored that my filmography could have uh, really kind of influenced you guys. And honestly, like I never thought about my audience. I just tried to make work on things that I would like to see on on TV. It wasn't until the last couple of years that you know, with Twitter and, and social media, that um, interacting with the fans that I really got to have that hear that feedback and 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 kind of see the impact of my work over the years and it's 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 very eye-opening but it's very humbling it's also really cool that you know what i love and what i do for a living can you know uh influence you guys just like all the stuff that all of the creators that influenced me growing up had that impact on me so like i said I, i thank you and all the fans for all the support as well as just making this this guy who wanted to be a doctor feel like I made the right decision to 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 follow this path and, and be a, a filmmaker. Uh, yeah, you, you definitely did, man. And for the audience, you guys can catch Jay uh, Oliver uh, on Twitter, Jay Oliver one and he's also on Vero. Uh, he just joined recently. And yep. same thing. And I haven't posted anything yet, but uh, when but I, I post it, it'll hopefully be to something big. All right, <laughs> awesome. And, of course, you can follow myself, Zayan, Umar, and Samir on Twitter and on Vero as well. And if you guys want to listen to this podcast, you know you're going to find it on YouTube by this weekend as well as on iTunes. So just remember to subscribe. And we always, we have great stuff on the way, more guests on the way. So just one more time from myself, from Zion, from Umar, from Sumir, and from Jay Oliver. Uh, thank you so much, guys. See you around. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.